Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second day of our ACIP meeting. Uh, today is June 22nd, and I'm pleased to call our ACIP meeting to order. Um, I will take roll call now for the members only, um, and uh, because we do have a vote later today, I will ask you to again uh, not only state your affiliation, but any conflicts of interest you may have. Um, and I'm going to look to my left to <laughs> Dr. Wharton's list. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to go in alphabetical order today. We're going to start with Ms. Lynn Bata. Good morning, Lynn Bata. I am the immunization clinical consultant at the Minnesota Department of Health, and I have no conflicts. Thank you. Dr. Bell? Good morning. Beth Bell, clinical professor, Department of Global Health, University of Washington. No conflicts. Thank you. Dr. Brooks? Oliver Brooks, interim CEO and CMO, Watts Healthcare Corporation, Los Angeles. I have no conflicts. Thank you. Dr. Chen? Wilbur Chen, Professor of Medicine, Center for Vaccine Development and Global Health. I have no conflicts. Thank you. Dr. Sineas? Good morning. Sybil Sineas. I am an Associate Professor of Medicine and Pediatrics at the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University and a practicing internist and pediatrician. I have no conflicts. Thank you. Dr. Daly? Good morning. Matt Daly, General Pediatrician and Senior Investigator at the Institute for Health Research, Kaiser Permanente, Colorado. Uh, no conflicts of interest. Thank you. Dr. Cotton? Camille Cotton. I am the Clinical Director of Transplant and Immunocompromised Host Infectious Diseases at Massachusetts General Hospital and Associate Professor at, at Harvard Medical School. Um, my conflict of interest is that I am involved in a clinical trial with Takeda for an, in, an investigational antiviral agent. Uh, this does not in any way involve vaccines. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lair. Dr. Jamie Lair, Private Family Practice, Ithaca, New York. I have no conflicts. I uh, think Thank you. Dr. Long. Good morning, Sarah Long, Professor of Pediatrics at Drexel University College of Medicine, practicing in pediatric infectious disease doctor. I have no conflict. Thank you. Ms. McNally. Good morning. Veronica McNally, President of the Franny Strong Foundation based in Michigan, and I have no conflicts. Thank you. Dr. Paling. Good morning. Dr. Kathy Paling, I'm from Atrium Health, Wake Forest Baptist, Wake Forest School of Medicine, professor of pediatrics and um, preventive medicine. I have no conflicts. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Pablo Sanchez, I'm professor of pediatrics at The Ohio State University College of Medicine, neonatologist and pediatric infectious diseases at Nationwide Children's and have no conflict. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Talbot. Good morning, Kip Talbot, Professor of Medicine and Health Policy at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. No conflicts. Thank you, and Grace Lee, CQO at Stanford Medicine Children's Health and Professor of Pediatrics at Stanford University School of Medicine, and I have no conflicts. Um, and with that, I believe we will start with our meeting slides this morning. Mm -hmm. Would you like, uh, hold on one second. Thank you, all right, we'll proceed to the next slide. So um, as a reminder, this is the last <laughs> in-person meeting uh, for many uh, of our members of the committee who are rotating off. And we wanted to just take a moment to pause and thank them for their service. Um, and so we will go through uh, all of the committee members who are rotating off uh, uh, the committee as of June 2023. Um, we are excited to have a new slate of candidates come forward. Um, I will start with Ms. Lynn Bata who has very ably served on the meningococcal work group, polio work group, the zoster work group, and she has chaired the rabies work group, the measles, mumps, and rubella work group, and the general best practices work group. So an incredible amount of service in her four years with ACIP. Um, I just wanted to share that she in my mind has played a pivotal role in the ACIP, shaping our policies based on her wealth of experience as a public health nurse and immunization expert for over three decades. Um, she has been at the forefront of working and partnering with providers and communities to support vaccination efforts and always has reminded us of the importance of 
education and partnership to ensure that we are doing our best to not only make recommendations about vaccines, but also to be able to actually deliver those vaccines in the community. Um, and many of you might remember her pivotal role in responding to the measles outbreak in Minnesota, from which much of her um, uh, expertise was much appreciated and needed. Um, we are so grateful for her willingness to share her expertise and experience with our committee over the past four years and want to thank her for her service. Next. Oh. <laughs> Um, thank you, everyone. The committee wanted to applaud Lynn for her service. Thank you. <laughs> um, on the next slide, we have Dr. Beth Bell. Um, I am sad you couldn't be with us here today, Beth. Uh, you have served on ACIP for four years. Um, and as many folks know, previous to that, she has served at CDC for over two and a half decades, including as the former director of the National Center for Emerging, Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases, so NCEZID. Um, she has seen and managed every outbreak over her tenure at CDC. And as I was reflecting back on her service, recognizing that she has gotten the country through Ebola, anthrax, chikungunya, cholera, H1N1, fungal meningitis, and those are just the highlights. Um, and then she thought her retirement from CDC would give her a moment of respite, um, and that becoming a member of ACIP would give her the ability to continue to serve in a different way. Uh, but outbreaks seem to follow Dr. Bell wherever she goes. So shortly after starting ACIP, she was pulled in to chair the COVID-19 work group as the pandemic was just beginning. And that was a really tough and uncertain time for so many. Um, she now has handed off that work group to, the, uh, to Dr. Daly. Um, but then, uh, you know, dengue, monkeypox, and chikungunya um, uh, did not uh, stop. So she was, <laughs> she was pulled back into service. Um, and we are very grateful to Beth for sharing her wisdom and her guidance with us over the past four years, and very grateful for her service to our country. And I just want to thank you, Beth, because I think you have um, guided me uh, during uh, great times of uncertainty, particularly around COVID-19 as I came on as chair. Um, and I have often gone to her for advice and guidance just when I needed a little bit of help and she's always been available. So thank you, Beth, for all that you've done. <laughs> Next slide, oh great. Ms. Veronica McNally. This is the best to be able to talk about your colleagues. <laughs> um, so, uh, Veronica is special in so many ways, but she really has played a critical role in our committee as the consumer representative for ACIP. And we have been so fortunate that she's been willing to serve for not four years, but for five years. <laughs> um, she has been a tremendous public health advocate. Um, many know her as president of the Franny Strong Foundation, and she's also served on the faculty and more recently as assistant dean for experiential education at Michigan State University College of Law. And her um, her clear thinking um, clearly reflects her experience. Her clear thinking and logic to get us through decision making <laughs> are clearly reflect reflected in the discussions that we have and the contributions she makes to the committee. Um, she is one of the people who always brings us back to why we are here in the first place, which we really appreciate. Um, she makes sure that we focus on our children, our grandparents, and each other. She has been and always will be the voice of the people who have no voice and the conscience of our committee. And so we thank you for all your service. <laughs> Next, we have Dr. Kathy Paling. Um, and I apologize, I forgot to read off all the work groups, but I'm just gonna read off again that she has chaired um, the pneumococcal work group and the meningococcal work group and co-chaired the dengue work group. She's chaired the tick-borne encephalitis work group and served on the combined immunization schedules work group. Um, and it's with great pleasure that we're able to recognize Dr. Paling for her tremendous service to our committee. Um, she is the person we call on to lead very complex work groups with extremely challenging decisions. Um, she is also a national recognized, nationally recognized leader in pediatrics and a true champion for the health and the well-being of children. Um, she has had an indelible imprint on our committee with her ability to ensure we remain, we, we remain focused on the key issues and that we can interpret and clearly explain the rationale for decision making, and that we create a supportive learning environment, not only for our committee members, but also for the public. 
We are so appreciative of the optimism and clarity she brings to our committee and her continued attention to ensuring that we remain focused on health equity and the health of population. So thank you, Dr. Paling. Um, and finally, Dr. Pablo Sanchez, who has served as chair of the Monkeypox Workgroup, the RSV Pediatric Maternal Workgroup, um, General Bra Best Practices Workgroup, and chair of the Cholera, cholera Workgroup. Um, so Dr. Sanchez has been an incredible presence in our committee. Um, we all know him as a colleague who has um, created a new field that combines neonatology and pediatric infectious diseases, and he has such unique expertise that is reflected in his workgroup membership. Um, not only has he served on ACIP for the past four years, but we often call on him to help us with um, decisions that are uh, different for the committee as we look to the future and really focus on both pregnant moms and their neonates. Um, and uh, to have his expertise on this committee at this time has been so critical for our decision making. Um, as a pediatrician, uh, he has touched the lives of countless children and families, um, providing the kind of care you would want from any physician. And I have to say that um, we have had so many meetings over the past four years together, Pablo, and every time we're in one of our virtual meetings, what I notice is that no matter what time of day it is, whether it is morning, noon, evening, or even on the weekends, you're in your office. <laughs> you are one of the most dedicated clinicians I have ever met, not only providing your um, expertise to the committee, but also ensuring that you're there at the bedside for your patients, your trainees, and families. It's really amazing what you're Willing, you know, your willingness to give and serve uh, others. So we are very appreciative, again, of your service to our committee and want to thank you for everything you've done. And, and now it's my task to, uh, to recognize uh, Dr. Grace Lee, who is our outgoing chair of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Uh, Dr. Lee has the distinction, I am sure, of presiding over more ACIP meetings than any chair in history. Uh, and I think this is a record that no one will want to challenge her for. Um, she asked earlier if there was a Guinness Book of World Records entry for this, and there should be. And if so, it would be Dr. Lee. Um, uh, in addition to her services chair, she served on a, a, a number of work groups, including the COVID-19 work group. She had served at, previously as chair of the pneumococcal work group and of the zoster work group, and um, as the uh, chair of the COVID vaccine safety work group. Um, Additionally, she previously served as chair of the evidence-based recommendations work group, and I think this was such a valuable background for her to bring to her work as chair because uh, Dr. Lee has really had a very strong commitment to improve, to maintaining and improving ACIP's evidence-based practices and uh, and recommendations and has, has really been a tireless champion for the work of this committee, um, both in the meetings where it's visible um, and, and in our planning. So I, I'm very grateful for her service. Um, she's, she's been wonderful to work with. Um, she's been a wonderful representative, uh, a public-facing representative for the committee, and we're it, it's been a, a personal pleasure and honor for me to work with you over the last couple of years, uh, and um, we are incredibly grateful for your service to the committee. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> that was very kind. Um, I wanted to just uh, pause for a moment and on the spot uh, for the, our departing committee members, you don't have to say anything, but if you did want to just take 30 seconds to say a few words, please feel free to chime in. And I am putting them on the spot, so I apologize <laughs> for that. Um,
Dr. Paling. I want to uh, share what an honor and pleasure it has been to serve and learn with such incredible colleagues. Um, this experience on the ACIP has been truly eye-opening and provided the insight to the amazing collaboration, professionalism, and unbelievable expertise of all CDC colleagues who are able to pull together incredibly difficult information in such a timely way in enabling all of us to do the work. I hold our CDC colleagues in the highest esteem. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paling. Um, Dr. Bell? Uh, thank you. I, I just wanted to, you know, th uh, thank you for the kind words. Thank uh, the committee for um, such uh, collegial and stellar cooperation. And it's been a pleasure to work with everyone. Uh, this uh, it will is an understatement, but this has been an extremely challenging time in public health, even, you know, based on my many decades. Um, and um, I'm uh, grateful for the opportunity. And I, um, again, I just want to say thanks. And um, I look forward to sort of keeping up with how things develop in the future. Thank you, Dr. Bell. No more pandemics. <laughs> uh, Ms. Bata. Um, I, too, want to thank um, ACP, the ACIP Executive Committee for um, allowing me this opportunity. It has been such a privilege to work with the giants, not only here at CDC um, and their, their drive for excellence, but also among my colleagues here in ACIP. Um, it's, it's been an experience where I've learned um, that I'm still learning that I don't know everything but that I do have friends and family who can tell me everything about vaccines um, when I don't have the answer. But thank you. Thank you. Dr. Sanchez? I just also just want to thank, first of all, thank you, Grace, for the very kind words. I want to thank Dr. Romero and really the committee, because it's, it really truly has been an honor, um, and it's been a really uh, wonderful experience working with the ACI, with the CDC um, members and and those and the, who lead the work group, because um, without them, it's, it would have been an impossible task. And they were just superb. And thank you. Thank you, and Ms. McNally. I really appreciate the opportunity that I've had to serve on ACIP and want to recognize the hard work of the CDC team and also all of my colleagues on this committee over the years. Uh, it is an understatement to say that the ACIP improves public health through its work. And it is really remarkable to see it from the consumer perspective. And so I thank the CDC for the opportunity to provide some of the consumer voice and for the opportunity for the public moving forward to be able to share um, their perspective on being able to really, truly impact um, everything that we do in health through vaccine prevention. Thank you, Ms. McNally. And I um, also just want to echo my thanks to our committee. This has been an incredible team, um, and especially to the CDC, who honestly, um, the service of our CDC colleagues, I'm looking at, to my left at Dr. Wharton, ahead of me to Dr. Romero, and around the room of all of the colleagues who support the work that needs to happen. Um, there are many people who folks don't hear from, uh, who are behind the scenes, who are actually getting the work done. And uh, uh, the public will never know the incredible service um, and dedication of our CDC colleagues um, and many of our other federal colleagues who have served so ably and especially during the pandemic 24 seven to be called on um, to respond to things that the public will never see because they prevent um, many of the outbreaks. Um, they spend a lot of time making sure that they keep us safe. Um, and we often take that for granted. But for those of us who got at least a little glimpse of this on our committee time, uh, we are very grateful and we will continue to be grateful for the service that our colleagues provide. So thank you. Oh, Dr. Sanchez. 
I just want one more thank you. I'd like to thank Amanda Cohn because she really led us through the COVID experience and wonderfully. Thank you. Thank you for calling out Amanda. Um, Amanda, I hope you're listening. <laughs> uh, with that, we're going to move on to agency updates. Um, so uh, we will uh, start with our updates from our ex officio representatives, uh, Dr. Romero from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Let me add my personal thanks uh, for your work chairing this committee during a most uh, difficult time. Um, and to the uh, members that are rolling off the committee, thank you for all your work. Uh, the American public can never thank you enough for what you've done. And lastly, for those of you that are staying on, um, thank you for taking on this commitment for the next uh, few years and those that will be rolling on again. I'm truly honored to be working with you. Um, let me begin with my um, uh, updates. <clears throat> so throughout the meeting, excuse my voice, it's a little rough. Um, throughout this meeting, um, you will receive um, the most current and comprehensive information on many of CDC's uh, efforts. I will keep my CDC updates brief and only share high-level updates on COVID-19, influenza, measles, and efforts to maintain childhood vaccination coverage. Turning to COVID-19, it remains a key public health priority. Uh, COVID-19 hospitalizations and deaths continue to decline um, uh, for the seasonal peak, from the seasonal peak of January 2023. These peaks were far lower uh, than those seen during the two previous winters. CDC provides weekly updates on COVID-19 vaccine distribution and administration on the COVID-19 uh, uh, CDC uh, data tracker website. As of June 11, 2023, uh, greater than 56 million individuals have received an updated bivalent COVID-19 vaccine dose. Since the recommendation of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine for children aged 5 to 11 years, greater than 9 million individuals aged 5 to 11 years have completed the primary se se series. While most Americans continue <clears throat> to pay nothing out of pocket for COVID-19 vaccine due to their insurance coverage, 25 million uninsured American adults are at risk of losing access to affordable vaccines for COVID-19 and treatments when these transition to the commercial marketplace. In April 2023, HHS announced the Bridge Access Program for COVID-19 Vaccines and Treatment. This public-private partnership provides under and uninsured adults with access to COVID-19 vaccines and treatments at no cost from the fall of 2023 to the end of 2024. Turning now to influenza. Seasonal influenza, following a moderately severe influenza season that peaked earlier than usual, in late fall and early uh, winter, uh, influenza vaccination provided substantial protection this season. CDC again partnered with the Ad Council and the American Medical Association for their annual Get My Flu Shot campaign. The campaign encouraged the American public, with emphasis on black and Hispanic audiences, to get vaccinated against the influenza for the season 22-23. Planning for a new campaign uh, for the 23-24 season is underway. With regard to avian influenza, the health risk <clears throat> excuse me, to the general public uh, from the currently circulating influenza A, H5 viruses remains currently low. However, CDC and others remain very vigilant for this. An H5 Canada vaccine was developed by CDC and made available uh, to vaccine manufacturers in early 2022. CDC continues to work with international, national, state, and local partners to detect H5 and to prevent transmission through enhanced surveillance and guidance for people who are, may be exposed to infected birds. And CDC continues to analyze viral sequence data for genetic markers associated with greater uh, disease severity, more efficient infectivity transmi uh, transmissibility to humans, reduce susceptibility to antiviral drugs or impact on candidate vaccines and diagnostics. With regard to measles, with declines in measles vaccination rates globally during the COVID-19 pandemic, measles outbreaks are occurring in all World Health Organization regions. The United States has seen an increase in measles cases from 49 in 2021 to 121 in 2022. All have occurred among children who aren't fully 
uh, uh, vaccinated, including the outbreaks in Minnesota and Ohio. Jurisdictions at highest risk for measles continue to be those contained communities with persistently low vaccination coverage and importations from locations uh, with measles outbreaks. And lastly, our current efforts to maintain childhood vaccination coverage. CDC launched the Let's Rise campaign to address pandemic-related declines in routine immunizations and equip partners and healthcare providers with actionable strategies, resources, and data to support getting all Americans back on schedule with their routine immunizations. More information about Let's Rise and access to routine immunization resources and data can be found on CDC's website. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Romero. Uh, next, we will move on to the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Ms. Hans. Thank you very much and good morning. Um, I'm gonna start where Dr. Romero left off, which was to say that CMS continues to emphasize the importance of routine pediatric immunizations. One way we've done this is through the Connecting Kids to Coverage campaign, which provides materials that can be used or rebranded to outreach grantees, as well as a variety of partners who include um, government agencies, community organizations, healthcare providers, schools, and others. There are many tools available um, related to vaccines on the Connecting Kids to Coverage campaign website and in addition, there was a back to school webinar that was held on Tuesday of this week that emphasized among other things, the importance of immunizations and of getting caught up on immunizations before school. Um, shifting to follow up from yesterday's RSV vaccines for adults conversation, I am able to confirm from my colleagues on the Medicare side of CMS that um, if this vaccine, um, is recommended, it will be included in part D, as in David, of the Medicare program. And those are my updates. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, we have the Food and Drug Administration, Dr. Caslow. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to provide a, a very brief update on actions taken since the ACIP meeting in February. Um, as discussed yesterday, two RSV vaccines with proposed indications for use in adults 60 years of age and older were reviewed by Verpac, and they were subsequently approved both in May. In addition, Verpac also met to review an RSV vaccine with a proposed indication for the prevention of lower respiratory tract disease and severe lower respiratory tract disease caused by RSV in infants from birth through six months of age by active immunization of pregnant individuals. Also reviewed here yesterday were Verpac's recommendations in March on the selection of strains to be included in the influenza virus vaccines for the 2023-2024 uh, influenza season. In April, FDA amended the emergency use authorization, or EUAs, of the two COVID-19 bivalent mRNA vaccines to simplify the vaccination schedule for most individuals and to authorize the current bivalent vaccine containing original and Omicron BA4, BA5 strains for all doses administered to individuals six months of age and older. Um, a week ago, Verpac met to discuss and make recommendations on the selection of strains to be included in the periodic updated COVID-19 vaccines for the 2023-2024 vaccination campaign. The committee unanimously voted to update the vaccine composition to a monovalent COVID-19 vaccine with an Omicron XBB lineage and expressed a preference for the XBB.1.5 sublineage. On June 16th, FDA advised manufacturers who will be updating their COVID-19 vaccines that they should develop a vaccine with a monovalent XBB.1.5 composition for the 2023-2024 formula of COVID-19 vaccines in the United States. Also in April, FDA co-hosted with BARDA a workshop on recombinant protein-based COVID-19 vaccines to review and discuss overcoming challenges faced by recombinant protein vaccine platforms in timely, timely strain updates and pandemic readiness. Highlighted in that workshop was the timely availability of additional updated COVID-19 vaccines 
beyond the current nucleic acid-based vaccines approved for use at the onset of periodic vaccination campaigns. Finally, a number of regulatory actions are anticipated in the coming months as reflected in the current ACIP meeting agenda. The magnitude of the current submissions under review is unprecedented. So let me end by thanking on behalf of the Office of Vaccines Research and Review and CBER, ACIP, and the many ACIP working groups for their partnership in the work on this very large portfolio of vaccine and vaccine candidates. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kaslow. I think we were hoping for fewer meetings, but you're telling us that we have many <laughs> meetings ahead, so uh, happy to do the work. Um, next, we have uh, Health Resources and Services Administration, Dr. Grimes. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to give a brief update today. Uh, the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program continues to process a high volume of claims in fiscal year 2023 as of June 1st. Petitioners have filed 747 claims with the VICP and $119.6 million has been awarded, including awards to petitioners and for their attorney fees and costs. In addition, the VICP is working on a backlog of 1,363 claims alleging vaccine injury. More data about the VICP can be obtained at their website. The Countermeasures Injury Compensation Program update, uh, as of June 1st, 2023, 11,806 claims alleging injuries or death from COVID-19 countermeasures have been filed with the CICP including 8,372 claims alleging injuries from COVID-19 vaccines. CICP has rendered vaccine their decisions on 919 COVID-19 claims. 25 of those countermeasure claims have been determined medically eligible for compensation. 20 claims are pending a review of the eligible expenses and four have been compensated, with one that did not have eligible expenses for reimbursement. 894 COVID-19 countermeasure claims uh, have been denied compensation because of various reasons. More information about the CICB can be found at its website. Over, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have Indian Health Service, Dr. Clark. Thank you and good morning. The Indian Health Service continues to prioritize access, quality, and equity in vaccine distribution and administration for American Indian and Alaska Native tribal communities served by the IHS system of care. Following expiration of the public health emergency, we've remained committed to our efforts to prom promote COVID-19 vaccination in all age groups in every region. We are currently implementing a national vaccine strategy for the tribal communities served by IHS federal, tribal, and urban Indian organization programs. The E3 vaccine initiative is designed to promote access for every patient at every encounter to every recommended vaccine when appropriate. This includes all ACIP recommended vaccines in all age groups. Working in collaboration with key stakeholders, especially our tribal and urban Indian organization partners, IHS is committed to improving general vaccination rates in tribal communities. Our E3 operational plan includes a bottom-up approach to encourage innovation, incentivize effort, and recognize success, drawing on the adaptability of our comprehensive healthcare system to cross-pollinate federal, tribal, and urban Indian programs using best practices developed in Indian country for Indian country. Following rollout of our E3 Champions pilot program this spring, I'm pleased to report that over two dozen federal, tribal, and urban Indian programs have applied for and received designation as an IHS E3 Champion pilot site. We look forward to continued collaboration with our tribal, urban, and federal partners to ensure access to safe and effective vaccines and to reduce morbidity and mortality from vaccine preventable illness across the age spectrum for American Indian and Alaska Native people served by the Indian Health Service. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Peigel. Yeah, good morning. Um, the National Institute of Health continues to support basic and clinical research to improve human health. And a large part of what we do is centered around new and better vaccines. So I just wanted to highlight a few studies and other updates that may be of interest to ACIP. 
Um, for COVID-19, uh, although current, uh, currently available vaccines are highly effective at preventing severe disease, infection, and death, there's significant interest in mucosal vaccines that could potentially reduce transmission of the virus and or asymptomatic disease. In, in November, NIAID co-hosted a workshop on the science of developing mucosal vaccines for SARS-CoV-2. The workshop highlighted what is known as well as gaps in the field and a potential path uh, forward. Uh, a link to the manuscript uh, that uh, summarizes the workshop will be provided in the written comments. Related to the, ne the need for advancing next generation vaccines, Project NextGen was announced in May. Project NextGen is a coordinated effort where NIDA and BARDA will work with the private sector to advance pipeline of new innovative uh, 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 vaccines into clinical trials. NIAID's efforts are going to focus on structured program evaluating multiple next-gen COVID-19 vaccines in phase one and phase two clinical trials. A link will be provided in the written comments, but it can also be found just by searching NIAID project next-gen. Uh, so shifting to tuberculosis, a clinical trial testing a freeze-dried temperature stable uh, uh, tuberculosis vaccine uh, was found safe and effective in simulated antibodies as well as the cellular immune response. A non-stable uh, temperature uh, form had previously been studied, but this is the first time any subunit TB vaccine in a temperature-stable form has been evaluated, which is critical when we think of how to uh, roll out a TB uh, vaccine. For Influenza, uh, a clinical trial of an experimental mRNA universal influenza vaccine uh, developed by NIAID's Vaccine Research Center began enrolling volunteers at Duke. This is the first uh, investigational universal flu uh, vaccine candidate uh, tested by the Collaborative Influenza Vaccine Innovation Center or, or CIVICS program, it's a, which is a program to advance more durable, broadly protective, and longer uh, lasting influenza vaccines. Uh, for RSV, the approval of RSV vaccines marks an important step towards protecting the nation from this serious respiratory disease. I, I, we think it's important to highlight that that accomplishment is a, a result of decades of scientific discovery and research funded by the NIH as well as many other groups. The development of effective vaccines takes time. Uh, it is a series of incremental discoveries and steps, but good science is fundamental to getting effective vaccines like we saw voted on yesterday. Uh, and lastly, for HIV, May 18th marked the 26th anniversary of HIV Vaccine Awareness Day. Uh, an effective, safe, long-lasting HIV vaccine remains crucial for ending the HIV pandemic worldwide but HIV continues to pose formidable challenge to vaccine development due to its ability to mutate rapidly, hide in reservoirs uh, that the immune system cannot reach. The NIH applauds efforts of the global community of scientists, advocates, study participants, funders, uh, enabling unprecedented levels of innovation and adaptation in pursuit of a highly effective HIV vaccine. Uh, there are several other updates uh, that uh, and, and links to everything I said will be provided in the written comments. And this concludes the update from the National Institute of Health. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy. I believe we have Ms. Marshall on. Yes, good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to provide a very brief report. The National Vaccine Program, housed within the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy, is working on the progress report for the Vaccines Federal Implementation Plan and will work with federal agencies over the summer to provide their progress across, across goals and strategies. The National Vaccine Advisory Committee convened on June 16th and 17th in an effort to be responsive to emerging challenges in immunization, select agenda topics included preparing for the potential approval of passive immunization products, restoring vaccination rates in the post-pandemic period, and addressing clinician fatigue. The committee updated their progress on two ongoing charges, including the charge on vaccine innovations and the vac and vaccine safety. This concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
um, and our agency updates are complete. Uh, before we introduce the first session, however, um, we did have a request from our members to take a moment from our agenda today uh, to pause and share reflections on yesterday's vote and my oversight for not including that yesterday. Um, we're offering this time before the start of our first session to allow members who wish to share the reasons for their vote uh, with the public. Um, and it could be for any of the votes, but please be specific about which vote you're talking about if you did want to share some reflections. Dr. Chen. Yeah, thank you for letting me make this comment because I think um, yesterday personally was, was fraught with um, uncertainty. Um, that, that's what made my vote uh, as a no vote, which, which I didn't want anyone to interpret as, as a lack of enthusiasm for the potential true benefit of uh, this vaccine. I, I think we all recognize the burden of disease that RSV represents. So this, this really is a milestone achievement to have uh, such a vaccine being launched. Um, and and uh, for the adult pop older adult population, but then you know later on we will be uh, listening and hearing about uh, you know maternal pediatric population as well. I, I think you know for me the, um, the the uncertainty was was really in um, trying to understand what what the potential harm might be, which which we we don't uh, fully understand yet. The specter of this inflammatory neuropathies is is really concerning to me. And, and you know, for, for me, uh, you know, proceeding with caution was was really what was foremost in my mind. But uh, you know, also balanced against uh, you know what I heard yesterday from terrific presentations by doctors Melgar and and Britton were uh, you know talking about the uh, the equity question uh, regarding these vaccines and the burden of disease uh, in in uh, persons with certain. Condition, circumstances, or social determinants—you know—that that was very compelling for me as well. So, you know, I, I think again, um, I, I didn't want there to be lack of enthusiasm uh, for this vaccine, and acknowledging again the, the great public health good uh, that will come out from this vaccine. But again, just um, leveraging that against um, some uncertainties uh, and and uh, proceeding with caution and, and wanting to know. Uh, uh, have more data to, to guide uh, decision making and making wise uh, decisions uh, with this vaccine. So, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Brooks? Yeah, thank you. I just want to echo one thing that was stated by Dr. Chin that's the equity aspect of the decision making. Equity was added to the ETR only about three or four years ago. I'm not sure that without it being there, we would have had such a clear focus and an understanding. It might have just been another slide. Uh, it was stark, and I'm appreciative of the ACIP for understanding that and voting in an affirmative for that 60 to 64 uh, utilization of the vaccine. Dr. Lear. Thank you. I want to echo what Dr. Chen said. I want to emphasize the benefits of these vaccines for the patients out there. I have concerns about the safety, but I want people to know that if they want the vaccine, that it's available and has many benefits. So while I have some concerns, I think it's a very valuable vaccine for the public. Dr. Cotton. So my, my no vote yesterday about the um, 65 and up was just that I was hoping for a broader uh, recommendation for all adults 65 and up in that my, I had concerns about the equity piece. We know that when we do shared clinical decision making that it is somewhat limiting to uh, who gets vaccinated and I was quite concerned about the equity data that we saw so I was hoping for somewhat of a, a broader recommendation. Nonetheless, the recommendation now that um, shared clinical decision making be used for all adults 60 and up, it makes for a more um, standardized and easy to understand recommendation. So. I'm glad about that. I do have also some safety concerns, although I think that there's real benefit, especially in those high-risk patients with multiple comorbidities. Um, we really hope that this will provide good protection for 
some people who are among the most vulnerable, which includes the estimated 3% of the U.S. population that is immune compromised, in whom we often see life-threatening um, disease. So uh, we do think that it will be a good vaccine for a disease that's almost as uh, common and significant as influenza. Um, and we really hope for more information on safety and then more information on the lack of booster response that we saw with vaccine. Because some of us are wondering whether the vaccine will be useful in the long run or what things will look like. Um, I'm excited because there are more vaccines on the horizon, as was mentioned um, by our colleagues at the FDA. So we'll have to see if it'll be um, one type of RSV vaccine or perhaps some type of um, multiple vaccines from maybe multiple different providers and approaches. So it's an exciting field. Um, I am glad to know that we have, for the first time, RSV protection for older adults. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Daly? Yeah, just reflecting on the vote yesterday, I think what perhaps the public may fail to appreciate is that it sometimes takes a little while for our vaccine recommendations to evolve. It takes a little while for recommendations to settle, if you will. Um, and there are many examples where initially a vaccine was recommended, for example, for a high-risk group, and then as we gathered more data, both about safety and about epidemiology, then the recommendation could settle. And it often settles as a universal recommendation. So I think yesterday highlighted all of the challenges, but we just need to recognize that was the, de that was the, de the decision for the day. And hopefully if, with more information, this will be another vaccine recommendation where we get clarity around these outstanding issues and I don't know where we're gonna settle, but I have confidence that we'll settle in the right place for maximal disease prevention. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Daly, I, I just wanted to echo that my uh, no vote yesterday was because I wanted to go back to the original motion. Um, so uh, it, I, you know, the factors that determined for me the the weight of one versus the other uh, were durability of protection and hence cost uh, because of the potential need for future revaccination and equity. Um, so balancing those along with safety, I think it was a tough decision. But Dr. Daly, actually, um, I think your comment about the fact that ACIP is a committee that uh, embraces dynamic decision making and continual review of data of the benefit risk balance, I think is the key point. So thank you for uh, making those remarks because I think that is uh, where the committee uh, should be and wants to continue to head. Dr. Bell. Um, thank you. Uh, it was, you know, I, I want to uh, sort of reiterate a couple of key points. Um, especially the idea that um, I want people to understand that my vote in favor of um, uh, clinical de clinical uh, decision making was not um, a vote of lack of confidence in in the vaccine, but more a matter of, as Dr. Daly was saying, um, in many of these complex situations, especially when there's um, a, sub a couple of very clear high risk groups, um, I feel like it's important to proceed um, with a certain amount of caution and deliberative uh, and understanding. And I think it is really important for the American public to understand that um, the whole point of having a committee like this is that we can continue uh, to look at the data as it develops, and we can tailor recommendations based on the information that we have at any particular time. And starting um, with something which is um, still a recommendation, it's an endorsement of the vaccine, but it's a suggestion that uh, there should be some uh, conversations with a provider uh, to, to sort of find the right match in terms of who should get the vaccine at this point. That to me is a prudent way to proceed with all of these issues about, I'm actually not as concerned about safety, um, but about durability, the boosting issue, new vaccines, 
the performance of the vaccine in the target in the most high risk groups. These are all things that we will learn more over a few years, a short, relatively short period of time. And uh, we'll have the opportunity to continue to develop the recommendations as we get more information. So I think this was a uh, it was a vote of confidence for the vaccine. I don't I mean, I don't want to speak for uh, all of the members, but uh, I think for the most part, the members who, and the ones who voted no have have said that they were not actually um, uh, opposed to some to approving the vaccine. So it is a vote of confidence. I think it's uh, important for people with high risk conditions um, to uh, get vaccinated. And we will continue to work dynamically as, um, you know, things change. That's one message I think that we all have learned many, many times over. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Any other comments? OK, thank you. Um, with that, we will move on to our first session of the day. So Dr. Kathy Paling, chair of the Numacaco Work Group, will provide an introduction and overview of today's session. Good morning. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Numacaco vaccine presentation on behalf of the entire work group. And um, I need to spend a moment just thanking the incredible um, ACIP member, Dr. Long, our ex officios, and our liaison representatives and consultants. This is the fourth time we've worked through pneumococcal issues to bring to a vote. And thank a special thank you to Dr. Mwako Kobayashi. In addition, the incredibly hardworking CDC contributors who have pulled together an amazing amount of data so that we can make the vote and our grade and ETR consultants who've guided us through this process. All right, so first of all, let me remind you about the pneumococcal um, serotypes in the vaccines. PCV13 is on the top. 15 includes 22 and 23. In, uh, in 33, 20 includes um, all in 15 plus five more. And then do note there is um, a polysaccharide vaccine. And we've highlighted what serotypes are included in there. Okay, so a reminder of our time frame. Um, the extended indication for PCV20 use among children was approved um, by our FDA colleagues on April 27, 2023. Um, and as a reminder of what we've done, the PCV15 and 20 was approved for use in adults in 2021. The pediatric PCV15 use was approved in June 2022. And then um, the um, we've just talked about the pediatric um, PCV20, which is what we're going to be focused on this April. Um, both PCV15 and 20 were approved based on safety and immunogenicity data compared to PCV13. There is no direct comparison of 15 and 20. There are unknown um, implications. Numerically, there are lower antibody responses to the components that are in um, PCV13 than PCV13. And numerically, there is higher antibody response among serotype 3 in PCV15 versus um, 13. And just as a reminder, serotype 3 disease is the most common cause of um, uh, conjugate-related um, disease in children and in adults. All children, this is a reminder, all children under two years of age have the same pneumococcal vaccine recommendation. It is three primary series and a booster, sometimes referred as three plus one, at two, four, six months, and a booster at 12 to 15 months. And right now, the recommendation is children can receive PCV 13 or 15. Children with certain underlying conditions are recommended to receive PPSV23 in addition to the recommended PCV doses. For healthy children, PCV doses, that's it. 
those with um, chronic medical conditions, CSF leak, cochlear implants are recommended to get um, PPSV23 um, at least eight weeks after the pneumococcal vaccine after the age of two. And then immunocompromised can get two doses. And then children with chronic medical conditions age six to 18 who somehow never received any conjugate vaccine are only recommended to get PPSV23 right now. All right, currently the risk-based risk, um, res, uh, ah, current risk-based pneumococcal recommendations in children and adults. So first of all, um, alcoholism in children is not included. Chronic heart disease is the same. There's a little bit of a difference in chronic lung disease, and I just want to spend a moment. What we currently say is children um, with chronic lung disease includes asthma if treated with high-dose oral corticosteroid therapy. In adults, it includes um, all asthma. And one of the questions that we like you to focus on through this is should we expand the indication for asthma? We will talk about the chronic liver disease because it is included in adults but not children. And so that will be another focus. And then chronic renal failure or nephrotic condition is um, uh, a current recommendation. One of the questions is, should we expand that to include earlier onset disease of chronic liver uh, renal uh, disease? The policy questions considered by the work group are the following. Should PCV20 be recommended as an option for pneumococcal conjugate vaccine according to currently recommended dosing and schedules for all children younger than two years of age? Should PCV20 without PPSV23 be recommended as an option for pneumococcal vaccine for children aged 2 to 18 years with underlying medical conditions that increase the risk of pneumococcal disease. So um, we will hear um, an economic analysis from Dr. Charles Stoker. We will uh, hear a comparison of cost-effectiveness analysis on PCV20 in children by Dr. Dupre, and then a summary of the workgroup interpretations, ETR and policy options by Dr. Kobayashi, and then there will be a VFC resolution by Dr. Sintoli. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Stocker, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Uh, my name is Charles Stecker. Next slide. I have no conflicts. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, so there are two policy questions um, that we're going to model here. The first is, should uh, PCV20 be recommended as an option uh, in the pneumococcal conjugate schedule? Uh, and the way that we're going to do this is we're going to evaluate uh, the current recommended schedule, either with 13 or 15, and the accompanying polysaccharide uh, in each of the populations, healthy, chronic medical conditions, and immunocompromised. Uh, and we're going to compare those to a schedule that includes PCV20 in the place of either PCV13 or PCV15. Next slide. The second policy question is whether we should include polysaccharide um, with PCV20. Uh, and we're going to do this two ways. Uh, if you look at the, the table at the bottom, one way is going to compare PCV20 by itself versus PCV13 plus PPSV or P P PCV15 plus PPSV. Um, and then the last two uh, lines in that table are going to compare, uh, they're going to assume that all kids are getting PCV20. Um, in the CMC or IC groups, and then does it make sense to add the polysaccharide vac vaccine to that recommendation? Next slide. Uh, we're going to use a cohort model. We're going to divide up the cohort model into about 90% of kids will be healthy, about 9% will have chronic medical conditions, and a tenth of the percent will have uh, immunocompromising conditions. Our model is going to run for 15 years after the final PCV20 shot. Next slide. Uh, and we're going to look at outcomes of various diseases. And then the important number will be the aggregate, which is at the bottom there, which is the dollars per quality. Next slide. Uh, the vaccine effectiveness, we're going to assume um, about 86% vaccine effectiveness for vaccine type IPD, 
and we're going to assume less against serotype 3 and serotype 19F. Uh, we're going to assume 51.6% conjugate vaccine effectiveness against vaccine type non-bacterial pneumonia, um, and then again less against serotype 3 and 19F, and 54% vaccine effectiveness against uh, acute otitis media, and then less against the serotypes 3 and 19. And we're going to assume this for all risk groups, healthy, CMC, and IC. Next slide. And here are the vaccine effectiveness numbers for the polysaccharide vaccine, which are going to be less than those for the conjugate vaccine. Next slide. For indirect effects, um, we're going to assume 7.8% for other children. Uh, so any kid that either didn't get the vaccine or isn't 100% effective, which uh, uh, which is all, all children. Uh, the effects on adults are going to be particularly important. In our base case, we're going to assume that uh, vaccinating kids removes 4.12% of adult disease every year. So it'll be 4.12% of disease the first year, and then 4.12% of the remaining disease in the second year. And when we average that out over the 15-year model, 15-year uh, uh, horizon of the model, um, it's going to be 3.12% per year. Uh, and then we're going to take those um, cost and quality savings from the adult model and apportion them to each risk group in accordance to how uh, many qualities are saved in that, that kid's risk group. So for example, if um, vaccinating healthy kids accounts for about 50% of the qualities saved um, uh, among children, then the healthy kids are going to be apportioned 50% of the qualities saved from the adult model. Next slide. Uh, we're going to assume different coverage rates for the different vaccines and the different doses. Uh, the vaccines will both, both the conjugate and the polysaccharide, will wait to zero by 15 years, though the conjugate will wane slightly slower. Next slide. Uh, we are, these are the model inputs. We're going to have uh, separate inputs for healthy versus CMC and IC, um, and separately by years. For acute otitis media, we assume no incidence um, after age four. Next slide. For the non-bacterial pneumonia, we have some detailed input numbers here. Next slide. Similarly, with IPD incidents, we're going to track meningitis and then the meningitis sequelae. The sequelae will be tracked beyond the 15-year time horizon of the model, so we'll incorporate the full life course of that, as well as any death, uh, et cetera. Next slide. Uh, for the serotype distributions, we're going to have one set of serotype distributions uh, that's age-specific. Uh, for invasive pneumococcal disease, as well as non-bacterial pneumonia, uh, and then a different set of serotype distributions for the acute otitis media. Uh, the key thing to look at here are the lines for the PCV20 only types, which range from 10 to 20% for IPD NBB, um, and as about 25% for AOM. Next slide. For the prices, the conjugate vaccines are all going to cost about the same, with PCV20 being slightly more expensive. Uh, the polysaccharide is going to be approximately half of that, and then we're going to include administration and caregiver time cost. Next slide. The disease costs are going to be pulled from um, adjudicated insurance claims, uh, and we're also going to include non-medical costs, which include productivity losses, et cetera. Next slide. For quality decrements, uh, the smallest acute amount is going to be for an earache, which is going to be a half a day. Um, and then the maximum amount is going to be for IPD meningitis, excluding the sequelae, which is going to be about six days. Next slide. The, um, this is going to be a model about the kids, but we're going to have to also model the uh, effects from the adult, uh, the, the effects of the kid program on the adults. Um, if you look at the second to last line of that first paragraph where it says qualies in the base case, which is the first column there, we're going to prevent uh, 1,262 qualities in the adult model, um, and that's going to amount to $80 million in medical cost savings. Um, and then if you skip to the, the last column here, when we assume that the adults have the same indirect effect as kids, uh, we get slightly more than double of both of those numbers. Next slide. So again, our two policy questions are, should we use the PCD20 in place of existing conjugate vaccines among all risk groups? And then the second question is, should a recommendation for PCV20 be accompanied by a recommendation for the PPSV23? Next slide. Uh, so here's the, the first set of results from our model. Um, we have the three uh, risk groups in columns. So the first column is for healthy, then for CMC, and then for IC. And if you look across the top, 
Um, those are the IPD meningitis cases prevented among each age group. Um, the, uh, the key driving numbers are going to be the costs and the qualities. Um, if you look at the second to last and third to last uh, lines in the top paragraph, um, childhood qualities amounts to 917 in the healthy population, and then the apportioned adult um, qualities uh, amount to 1,039. Uh, you can see that the, the adult model accounts for about half of the, the total qualities saves, saved from the childhood uh, schedule. Um, on net, the the total cost for vaccinating healthy kids with PCV20 instead of PCV13 is going to be $153 million. Uh, and then that's going to, if you look at the second to last line, amount to a cost per quality ratio of $78,000, uh, which is a which is a moderate amount. For the other two groups, um, the, the vaccine is going to be cost saving, which means it prevents more disease than the existing schedule and costs less on net because of the savings in medical costs. Um, in general, we're going to see that the vaccine looks better in the CMC and IC groups because we have assumed the same vaccine effectiveness across all three risk groups, uh, but we've assumed higher disease burdens in the CMC and IC groups. Next slide. Now we're comparing PCV20 to PCV15. Um, the first column again is for the healthy kids, replacing PCV15 with PCV20 in that three plus one schedule. Um, and if you look at the second uh, last line, you can see it costs $153,000 per quality uh, among the healthy, uh, though it is still cost savings in the CMC and IC groups. Next slide. So the next few slides, we'll do some sensitivity analysis around um, uh, some of the assumptions here. So in this slide, we've assumed that PCV20 has a 10% lower vaccine effectiveness than PCV15. Uh, if you look at that second to, to last line, you can see that in the healthy group, now the, the cost effectiveness ratio is $203,000 per quality. Um, and if you look at the second column, the CMC group is no longer cost saving, but costs a modest $23,000 per quality. Next slide. Uh, in this slide, we assume uh, that the adult indirect effects are much higher. So recall that our base case is about 3% uh, per year. So here it's 7.8%. Um, and in the healthy group, now it costs uh, $45,000 per quality, uh, as, uh, which is a much lower ratio as expected, and the CMC and IC groups are still cost saving. Next slide. Uh, here's some multivariate sensitivity analysis around the healthy group. Um, the intent of this slide is to generate a confidence interval. If you look at that second to bottom row, you again have the base case for the healthy group of $152,000 per quality, um, and then the fifth and 95th percentiles of that quality amount are $51,000 and $210,000 per quality. Next slide. This is a tornado diagram which organizes the um, inputs into the model according to how big their impact is on the final cost per quality number. Uh, the most important impact is in the top line, which is the indirect uh, adult qualities saved by the KID program. Um, and if you look at the right side of that bar, uh, when that number is drawn from the fifth percentile, meaning that the adult uh, qualities saved is very small in the fifth percentile, uh, the KID program in the healthy group costs almost $350,000 per quality. Um, and then the left side of that bar indicates that uh, when the adult about $75,000 per quality. Uh, the next um, line is about the adult costs. Um, and then the first uh, most important model uh, input from the KID model is the acute otitis media quality decrement. Um, but as you can see, all of the other um, inputs here uh, don't have large negative effects on the, on the um, cost per quality ratio, which is uh, what our primary concern would be. Next slide. So now we move on to policy question two, which is um, how important is the polysaccharide vaccine in recommending PCV20? Uh, so here we compare uh, the existing schedule of PCV13 plus PPSV for either the CMC or IC groups. We're omitting the healthy because they're not recommended to get the polysaccharide. Uh, and how would that compare to recommending just PCV20 by itself? Um, you can see in the top paragraph, all of the health outcome numbers are negative, meaning that we're on net, we are preventing more disease with PCV20 alone than with PCV13 plus PPSV. Uh, so, uh, and 
on on net, um, the, the the vaccine cost goes down uh, because we're no longer spending money on the polysaccharide, um, and it's just the PCB20. Uh, so of course we've we've achieved monetary savings and we've improved health. So these are going to be cost saving. Next slide. So this is the same question, but now PCV20 is replacing uh, PCV15. The first two columns are akin to the last slide, where PCV20 is replacing PCV15 plus the polysaccharide, and in both of those, it's cost saving. Uh, we were uh, a little bit concerned that we might have been overestimating the polysaccharide vaccine coverage. If the polysaccharide vaccine coverage was overestimated, uh, then there would be less um, savings available uh, when replacing the 15 plus the polysaccharide with just the PCV20. Uh, so if you look at the last line in the cost rows, uh, the vaccine cost goes from negative in the first two columns to positive in the last two columns. Well, but even when we assume that the polysaccharide only has half, cover half coverage, the cost effectiveness ratio is still quite modest in column three at $18,000 per poly or cost saving for the amount of compromised in the fourth column. Next slide. Uh, so this is maybe the most natural way to think about adding uh, the polysaccharide to um, a, a schedule with PCV20. Uh, so this assumes that the, uh, all CMC or IC kids are vaccinated just with PCV20 alone. And then we look at what the benefits and costs would be of adding the polysaccharide vaccine to that schedule. Um, if you look in the, in, the, in the top paragraph there, the numbers are um, negative or 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 small enough to be rounded to zero, um, though we do have some modest increase in qualities, nine qualities for the CMC group and one quality for the immunocompromised group. Um, but the vaccine costs are $40 million for the first column and, and uh, almost a million dollars for the second column. Um, and so the cost effectiveness ratios for adding the polysaccharide vaccine to uh, uh, PCV20 primary series um, are $4 million for the CMC and $690,000 for the IC group. Next slide. So limitations that must be acknowledged. First, um, the impact of indirect effects for, on adults is quite important. About half of the qualities saved are from that model. Uh, and we're not sure um, exactly how those are. Uh, we've, we've chosen numbers between 3 to, to almost 8% uh, to give you some idea of what, what it could look like. Um, the second limitation that uh, always has to be acknowledged is that acute otitis media is a big driver of uh, economic considerations for childhood um, pneumococcal conjugate vaccines, um, and uh, we've we've chosen to use a, a base case of uh, about a half a day per incident here. Um, but the the distribution that we've used around that shows that the model is responsive to that. Um, as as was mentioned in the previous presentation, the vaccine effectiveness of the twenty valent conjugate vaccine is based on immunogenicity trials. Um, we have done a sensitivity analysis where it's ten percent lower. Uh, but in our base case, we've assumed the same VE for all PCV valencies. Um, and then lastly, we have limited vaccine effectiveness data on serotype 3. Uh, so whether PCV20 react, reacts different than PCV15, um, is, uh, is we, we don't have enough data to, to say something about that. OK, next slide. So conclusions. For policy question one, which was, uh, should we replace PCV13 or PCV15 with uh, PCV20? I'm sorry, recommend PCV20. Um, uh, compare that to PCV13 or PCV15. Um, uh, we've aggregated across the three health conditions um, in the first bullet under each uh, each policy question. So in aggregate, uh, uh, recommending PCV20 instead of PCV13 uh, costs fifty thousand dollars per quality, fifty-seven thousand dollars per quality, um, and recommending PCV20 instead of PCV15 costs one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars per quality. Next slide. Policy question two is um, how important is the polysaccharide vaccine? So replacing either PCV13 plus PPSV23 or PCV15 plus PPSV23 with PCV20 by itself um, in the chronic medical conditions group or the immunocompromised group is cost saving. Um, and then the, the second bullet there is adding the polysaccharide vaccine to a schedule of PCV20 uh, costs $3.9 million um, per quality in aggregate, and that's based on the 4.1 million or 0.7 million for the CMC and IC groups, respectively. The last slide. Thank you. Thank you very much. This presentation is now open for questions.
Oh, Dr. Lair, I was going to say you left the committee speechless, <laughs> Dr. Stecker, but Dr. Lair raised his hand. I just want to say thank you for a wonderful presentation, very clear, and I appreciate especially the comparison of PCV20 versus PCV20 plus PPSV23, because that was very helpful for making my decision. Thank you. I don't see any hands raised. Dr. Stecker, I think your um, presentation was just very clear and concise. So I think there are no additional questions about this presentation, but I'm sure this will come up again later when we get to decision making. So um, we will plan to move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, next, we have um, Dr. Uh, Dupree. Uh, comparison of cost effectiveness analysis on PCB20 use in children. Thank you. Uh, today I'll be giving a summary of the three cost effectiveness analysis models on the use of PC20 in children in the United States. And team members of three models are shown on the slide. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. And here is a list of abbreviations I'll be using for this presentation. Particularly, I will refer to acute otitis media as AOM for children with chronic medical conditions but not immunocompromised. I'll refer to them as CMC. And for children with immunocompromising conditions, I'll refer to them as IC. I'll refer to the incremental cost effectiveness ratio as the ICER and invasive pneumococcal disease as IPD. So this is a brief outline. First of all, I'll give an introduction, then go over policy question one, which focuses on routine use of PC20 in children aged less than two years. I'll walk through the model description, health and cost outcomes, cost effect effectiveness results and assumptions, driving differences across the models. Then I'll do the same for policy question two, which focuses on PCV20 use in children with underlying medical conditions aged two to 18 years, then give an overall summary and conclude. Three models to be summarized today were developed by the Tulane CDC, MEC, and Pfizer teams. Assessments of a supplemental PCV20 dose in children who completed the PCV series with PCV13 or PCV15 are not included in this presentation. This is because of the differences in disease epidemiology compared to when PCV13 was introduced, and since the work group did not consider a preferential PCV20 recommendation after review of data. All three models were reviewed by the CDC Health Economic Team following ACIP guidance for health economic studies. Now we look at policy question one which is, should PCV20 be recommended as an option for pneumococcal conjugate vac vaccination according to currently recommended dosing and schedules for children aged less than two years in the United States? As both PCV13 and PCV15 are currently being used in the US, the models presented today compared PCV20 use, the intervention, to PCV13 and PCV15, the comparators, separately. The incremental cost effectiveness ratio, or ISA, was used to summarize the cost effectiveness of PCV20 compared to PCV15 and 13. The ISA is defined as the difference in total cost of the intervention and comparators divided by the difference in their health outcomes. Next is a general description of the three models for policy question one. Major differences will be highlighted in red. The Tulane CDC model uh, Tulane CDC and MEC models are single bed cohorts which run over a time horizon of 17 and 100 years respectively. The Pfizer model is a multi-cohort model that runs for 10 years. It starts with a total US population and introduces one cohort of children each year, a proportion of whom get vaccinated. Each of these models include indirect effects of vaccination as a relative reduction in the incidence of disease in the population. And all three models use a blended vaccine price, which was combined using public and private market price share weights, which varied across the models. 
Next, we look at some health and cost outcomes of the base case analysis, specifically com in comparison of PCV20 to PCV15. All outcomes are discounted except where specified with an asterisk. Results from the Pfizer model is orders of magnitude greater than the results from the other two models due to the assumption of indirect effects, which I will discuss later, and because it involved vaccination of 10 cohorts of children, unlike the other models, which vaccinated just a single cohort. Results of, uh, from the vaccination of a single cohort for the Pfizer model are provided in supplemental slides. The results on the slide show that compared to PC15, PC20 prevented more IPD, pneumonia and AM cases, and deaths which led to more qualies. Consequently, the cost of disease under PC20 are smaller compared to PC15 as shown by the highlighted cells. However, vaccination costs were higher under PC20 compared to PC15 due to the higher vaccine price of PC20 across the three models. This led to substantially increased total costs from PSV20 use in the Tulane CDC and MEC models, as the vaccine costs outweighed whatever gains were observed in the reduction of, in cost of disease. However, in the Pfizer model, PSV20 was associated with lower total costs. Next, we talk about the assumption of indirect effects in the models. Generally, higher indirect effects on adult inc disease incidents from PC20 pediatric use would lead to PC20 being more cost effective when compared to other PCVs. The MEC model only applied indirect effects on IPD incidents using estimates from a previous publication. Reduction in disease incidents occurred in the first four years and is maintained at that level throughout the model timeframe. From our review, we believe that the impact of indirect effect on pneumonia incidents was particularly important, and we'll look at the difference between the Pfizer and Tulane CDC models. The value is shown for approximate reduction in PC20 only pneumonia per vaccinated cohort for the Pfizer model were not provided, but calculated by the presenting author. Both models assume that the, present, the percent reduction due to indirect effects in vaccine type pneumococcal disease from all PCVs will be the same. However, they calculate these reductions differently, and the percentage of PCV20 only type pneumonia in the models is different. The Tulane CDC model applied a reduction in pneumonia disease incidence based on previously reported regression estimates per vaccinated cohorts using PC13 data from 2013 and the first half of 2014. The Pfizer model, on the other hand, used reduction estimates based on data between 2008 and 2018, even though PC13 was widely used from 2010, and the estimated percentage of PC20 only pneumonia disease is about two times greater than the Tulane CDC model, thus having the most favorable benefits from indirect effects due to PC20 use. Next is the cost effectiveness results comparing PC20 to PC13. In the base case, it was found to be cost saving in all models except the Tulane CDC model, where it was found to cost $57,000 for each quality gained. For comparison of PC20 to PC15, it was found to range between being cost saving to costing about $125,000 for each quality gained. Next, we look at some sensitivity analysis. And results across the models show that replacing PC20 with PC15, replacing PC13 um, with PC20 would range from being cost saving to um, costing $57,000 per additional quality gained. Compared to PC15, PC20 was found to range from being cost saving to PC20 being dominating by dominated by PCV15. In one scenario in the MEC model, PCV15 was cost-saving relative to PCV20. This scenario assumed a re-emergence of IPT as associated with certain stereotypes that PCV20 missed the trial primary endpoint. Next, we move on to policy question two, which is, should PCV20 without PPSV23 be recommended as an option for pneumococcal vaccination according to currently recommended dosing and schedules for US children 
ages 2 to 18 years with underlying medical conditions that increase the risk of pneumococcal disease, that's in CMC and IC populations. This policy question has two parts. First, what is the cost effectiveness of PCV20 alone compared to PCV13 or PCV15 with PPSV23 series in CMC and IC? And the second is, what is the cost effectiveness of adding PPSV23 to a PCV20 series among CMC and IC populations? First, to focus on policy question 2.1 on the use of PCV20 alone in CMC and IC populations compared to PCV13 or 15 plus PPSV23 PPSV series in these populations. And here are some health and cost outcomes for these questions. Specifically, in comparison of PCV20 alone to PCV15 plus PPSV23 in the CMC population. The Pfizer model had a different set of comparisons. Their model in this case was a cohort of six year olds, a proportion of whom they assume have history of PCV13 vaccination. In the base case, they compared the receipt of PCV20 only to the receipt of PPSV23 only. All three models showed that using PCV20 alone yielded lower IPD, pneumonia and AOM cases, deaths and higher qualities. However, the number of AOM cases averted in the Pfizer model is much smaller compared to the other two models because the burden of AOM is higher in children age five and below, but their model started from age six. All three models estimate lower total costs and higher health outcomes, as shown in the cells highlighted in red. Next, we look at the cost effectiveness results. Comparing the use of PC20 alone was found to be cost saving across all base case analysis when compared to PC13 and PC15 plus PPSV23 series in the CMC and IC populations. Next is sensitivity analysis. And results show that if PC20 alone were to replace current schedule of PC13 with PPSV23 in the same CNIC populations, it would be cost saving. Compared to PCV15 plus PPSV23 series in CMS and IC populations, results show that costs per quality gained would range from being cost saving to PCV20 being dominated by PCV15 plus PPSV23 series. P CV20 was dominated by PCV15 in one scenario in the MEC model where there was assumption of reemergence of IPD associated with certain stereotypes that PCV20 missed the trial primary endpoint. Next, we move to policy question 2.2, comparing PCV20 plus PPSV23 series to PCV20 alone in CMC and IC populations. Here are some cost effectiveness results. The values presented for the MEC model were not provided were calculated using the results in their technical report. For the CMC populations, in the base case, the cost per quality gained was found to range from $1.9 million to $6 million across the three models. For IC population, the cost per quality gained was found to range from $533,000 to $690,000 per quality gained. Next, we look at the summary. For policy question one, results show that vaccination with PC20 is expected to improve health outcomes compared to PC15 or PC13. Compared to PC13, the Pfizer and MEC, and MEC models estimated that PC20 would be cost saving, while the Tulane CDC model estimated it would cost $57,000 per quality gained. Compared to PC15, the Pfizer model estimated that PC20 would be cost saving, while the Tulane CDC and MEC models estimated that it would cost just over $100,000 per quality gained. For policy question 2.1, the use of PC20 alone compared to PC13 or 15 plus the PPSV23 series in CMC and IC populations was found to be cost saving in all but two scenarios investigated. And for policy question 2.2, Compared to PCV20 alone, PCV20 plus PPSV23 series in CMC and IC populations was estimated to cost between $204,000 to $7 million per quality gained. 
Differences across the models are majorly driven by indirect effect assumptions and other important factors discussed in the supplemental slides include model structure, vaccine effectiveness, and quality losses due to episodes of disease. I'd like to say thank you to my contributors and thank you everyone for listening. Thank you. And I want to just make a correction and confirm. It's Dr. Ayabina. Yeah, Dr. Diapri Ayabina. Thank you. <laughs> Apologies. I misread Fine. your name on the agenda. It's okay. So thank you very much for presenting. We really appreciate it. Um, this presentation is now open for questions. Um, I'm going to actually ask, could you just clarify, and I, I might have missed it, um, but there's two questions I had just for clarification. One is, um, how much of the difference is related to um, the timing of completion, so one PCB20 versus you know, a PCB13 or 15 following, uh, and, then, and then a PPSB23, which just requires more time difference? How much of that time difference makes a difference in the model? And then the second question I have is just, can you remind me, um, you had mentioned, I believe, serotype 3 and just the impact on the models in general. Um, in terms of uh, completion of the doses, I think um, for the PCV series he was given at, um, uh, the, fact, the primary series was given at age less than um, 2, and then the, fi the final dose at age 2. While for the PPSV is given at age six across the three models, so there wasn't much difference in terms of uh, um, the completion of the series across the different models. And for um, serotype three vaccine effectiveness uh, in the um, Pfizer, in the MEC and Tulane CDC models, they do apply a lower vaccine effectiveness for that serotype. Um, for the yeah, yeah, and then um, for the CDC, Tulane CDC model, as um, Charles presented, he did apply a lower um, vaccine effectiveness for that serotype, which generally didn't lead to totally different results. But it did make a difference across the three models in terms of their model results. Or, but generally, in terms of model conclusions, there was no major difference in terms of when they had a, a different value for the vaccine effectiveness for serotype 3. So it wasn't very sensitive to any assumptions about serotype 3 specifically? Just Yeah, it was different across the models, but not so sensitive in terms of model conclusions. Okay, thank you. Dr. Talbot? Yeah, um, I have a question that the work group leads may need to answer. The modeling was very interesting, but I noticed you used PCV20 and then a polysaccharide and a polysaccharide for those that are immunocompromised. And we know the polysaccharides are really not great and kind of blunt the immune responses. So why are we modeling PCV20, polysaccharide, polysaccharide, and not conjugate, conjugate, conjugate for these immunocompromised? Because I feel like we're doing more harm than good. Hi, um, thank you for that question. This is Dr. Kobayashi. So I think, I, I believe you saw that in the uh, Tulane CDC model when uh, for the first question, which was, you know, um, instead of PCB20, uh, excuse me, instead of the currently used conjugate vaccines, you know, 13 or 15, what happens if we swap that with a PCB20? So that's why the polysaccharide doses were kept. But to address the second question, which was specifically for children with underlying conditions who are currently recommended to get the polysaccharide vaccine, we did model for PCB20 only compared with uh, the current recommendation, um, conjugate polysaccharide or polysaccharide polysaccharide. I guess my thought is some of those children actually may need more than one dose or one series due to their immunocompromise, depending on when it is. So it wouldn't make sense to think, okay, do they need multiple conjugates? And so I just didn't know if that was also looked at. I see. Yeah, thank you for the clarification. So we did have discussions uh, while we were thinking about uh, the work group was discussing the policy options. But in the end, uh, we decided, you know, it was informed by cost effectiveness analysis findings and the uncertainties to um, look at um, PCV20 as part of the routine pediatric series. And we, we, we do plan on uh, following additional data um, if that recommendation is approved. And, and possibly considering getting rid of 
the polysaccharide. <laughs> that that will guess, come. That will come in the next session. Yeah, I guess part of the thing that we've been talking about is we've been talking about how we're nimble we are, and we've made these recommendations, and we can go back and change them. And I think the polysaccharide vaccine is the ultimate example of we're not very good at. at undoing things sometimes and so I'm just kind of pushing us a little bit so that as we now make recommendations talking about oh yeah we'll be so willing to change them in the future um, we really need to make sure that we're doing that currently and not just in the future yes um, thank you and I hope to provide a bit more um, uh, context in terms of the what the work group discussed um, during the next talk thank you any additional questions Dr. Sineas. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Could you clarify what it means um, when the cost saving is dominated for the sensitivity analysis for question 2.1? Okay. Um, I think I'll go back. Right here. Yeah. So. In one scenario in the MEC model where they assumed there was reemergence of IPD um, unique to um, some PCV20 ser serotypes that missed the primary endpoint, then uh, PCV15 was found to be cost saving relative to PCV15, and that's what we mean by uh, PCV20 was dominated by PCV15. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, we'll move on to Dr. Mawako Kobayashi, who will provide a summary of the work group interpretation on ETR and policy options. Thank you very much, um, and good morning. On behalf of the work group, I will present the work group's interpretation of 20-valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine use among U.S. children using the evidence to recommendations framework. Here are our two policy questions in a PICO format. Our first policy question targets all children under two years. For our second policy question, as Dr. Paling presented, the worker proposes changes to the indications for risk-based recommendations. The first changes are adding chronic kidney disease. Currently, chronic renal failure and nephrotic syndrome are included as immunocompromising conditions, but chronic kidney disease of other stages is not part of the risk-based recommendation. And changing chronic renal failure to um, maintenance dialysis for clarity. Next, we propose adding chronic liver disease to harmonize with adult recommendations. Lastly, including children with moderate persistent or severe persistent asthma. Currently, children with asthma have risk-based rec uh, vaccine recommendations only if they are targeted, uh, treated with high-dose oral corticosteroids, whereas for adults, asthma of any severity has indications for risk-based recommendations. These changes are proposed primarily to improve harmonization between pediatric and adult recommendations. In general, data on children with underlying conditions are limited, but there are data supporting increased risk of pneumococcal disease in children with asthma without long-term oral corticosteroid use, in children with chronic kidney disease regardless of stage, and in children with chronic liver disease. At the February ACIP meeting, we presented the work group's interpretation of ETR domains on public health problem, benefits and harms, and equity. Today, I will first provide a summary of the work group's interpretation of these ETR domains, followed by domains on values, acceptability, feasibility, and resource use that were not presented previously. First is public health problem. As reviewed in February, use of pneumococcal conjugate vaccines significantly decreased the incidence of pneumococcal disease in U.S. children. Outpatient acute respiratory illnesses caused by pneumococcus, such as acute otitis media, sinusitis, and pneumonia, are common causes of outpatient visits and antibiotic prescribing. 
the estimated incidence of pediatric outpatient visits and antibiotic prescriptions attributable to additional serotypes contained in PCV20 and not in PCV13 is four to five times the incidence attributable to additional serotypes contained in PCV15 but not in PCV13. In 2018 to 2019, the proportion of IPD caused by additional serotypes contained in PCV20 but not in PCV13 was approximately 30%, 15% for additional serotypes contained in PCV15 and not in PCV13, and 1% to 5% for additional serotypes contained in PPSV23 but not in PCV20. Risk of pneumococcal disease remains high in children with underlying conditions that increase the risk of pneumococcal disease. This graph shows the monthly invasive pneumococcal disease rates during 2018 to 2022 for U.S. children under five years from CDC's active bacterial core surveillance. Preliminary 2022 incidence in light blue shows that the rates in November and December when an increase in respiratory virus infections was reported exceeded the pre-pandemic rates in 2018 and 2019. The work group determined that pneumococcal disease is of public health importance for both groups of children. Next is benefits and harms. Benefits among children under two years were informed by two randomized controlled trials that enrolled healthy children randomized to receive either PCV13 or PCV20 using the three-dose primary series followed by a booster dose. These trials showed that PCV20 had numerically lowered IgG geometric mean concentrations compared with PCV13 for the 13 shared serotypes. Post dose 3, PCV20 did not meet non inferiority criteria compared with PCV13 for serotypes 1, 3, 4, 9B, 23F, and 12F for one of the outcomes. Post dose 4, PCV20 met the non-inferiority criteria compared with PCV13 for all 13 shared serotypes and for all seven additional serotypes. Safety was informed by findings from three randomized control trials. Across the three studies, serious adverse events were reported in 4.5% of the PCV20 recipients compared with 3.7% of the PCV13 recipients, but none were considered to be vaccine-related. Certainty of evidence against the critical outcomes shown here was moderate. For benefits, these are immunogenicity studies and there are no correlates of protection established for most outcomes of interest. For harm, certainty of evidence was downgraded for imprecision due to lack of vaccine-related serious adverse events being reported in studies with a relatively small sample size. For a second policy question, there were no PCV20 studies among children 2 to 18 years with underlying medical conditions, and the evidence was informed by one phase 3 non-randomized clinical trial with no comparator evaluating the safety and immunogenicity of PCV20 use in healthy children 15 months to 17 years. Participants received a dose of PCV20, and the study showed that PCV20 was immunogenic, for all 20 vaccine serotypes when assessed one month after vaccination compared with pre-vaccination baseline. In this study, serious adverse events within six months after vaccination was reported in 0.6% of the participants and none were considered to be vaccine related. Certainty of evidence for the critical outcomes shown here was very low. In addition to only having immunogenicity data, the included study was unblinded with no comparator group, and the study did not include children with underlying conditions. The work group determined that the desirable anticipated effects of PCV20 use were moderate for both groups of children. PCV20 provides the broadest serotype coverage among available PCVs, so it is expected to prevent more disease. However, it is unknown how substantial the protection conferred from PCV20 will be based on available data. And in addition, there are no data on PCV20 use among children with underlying medical conditions. The undesirable anticipated effects were considered to be minimal for both groups. Do the desirable effects outweigh the undesirable effects? The work group's interpretation was split between favors intervention, which is PCV20 use, and favors both, which are both the intervention and the comparator. The comparator for children under two years is either PCV13 or 15 use, 
in the comparator for children 2 through 18 years with underlying medical conditions is PPSV23 use after currently recommended PCV doses. Next is equity. Disparities in pneumococcal vaccine coverage by race, ethnicity, insurance coverage, and poverty level exist. Nationally representative PPSV23 vaccine coverage data among children with indications are limited, although the estimated coverage is lower than that of PCV. Disparities in IPD rates by race and the percentage of census tract poverty remain, and most of the remaining disparities were due to serotypes not included in PCV20. The majority of work group members believe that PCV20 use among both groups of children will probably increase health equity, although there were variable minority opinions. For routine PCV20 use among children under two years, some believed that new interventions like PCV20 are likely to be accessible in the wealthy communities first, and therefore could reduce health equity. Some believe that there is probably no impact since remaining disparities in vaccine type disease appear to be minimal. Some believe that equity will be increased based on our experience post-PCB13, which showed reduction in disparities in vaccine-type disease. For children with underlying conditions, some believed a risk-based recommendation is less likely to be equitable compared with routine vaccine recommendations, while others believe that PCV20 use without PPSV23 could simplify the current risk-based pneumococcal vaccine recommendations and improve vaccine coverage. Next, we will go over the additional ETR domains that were not presented in February versus values and preferences. Does the target population feel that the desirable effects from vaccination are large relative to undesirable effects? The work group's interpretation was probably yes for PCV20 use among children under two years and was split between probably yes and yes for children with underlying conditions. Is there important uncertainty about or variability in how much people value the main outcomes? The work group's interpretation was split between probably important uncertainty or variability and probably not important uncertainty or, or variability for children under two years and was probably not important uncertainty or variability for children with underlying conditions. The work group's interpretation reflects the uncertainties in evidence for this domain, such as lack of data assessing the public's perception of PCV20, data assessing efficacy or effectiveness of PCV20 against disease, and benefits from PCV20 use alone without PPSV23 for children with underlying medical conditions. Some, some work group members believe that caregivers would value use of PCV20 based on the current high PCV coverage in children and the increased rates of invasive pneumococcal disease in late 2022, as we saw earlier. Next is acceptability. The work group reviewed data from three web-based healthcare provider surveys. One was by Pfizer, the manufacturer of PCV13 and PCV20, and two were by Merck, the manufacturer of both PCV15 and PPSV23. In Pfizer's survey, participants were shown the profiles of PCV15 and PCV20, which emphasized the difference in IPD serotype coverage. 76% of providers responded that they would transition children under two years who started their PCV series with either PCV13 or PCV15 to PCV20. And 94% of those reported that they want to provide protection as, against as many serotypes as possible. 43% of providers responded that PCV20 alone without PPSV23 should be recommended for children with underlying conditions, and of those, 61% responded that they would prefer or store only one vaccine instead of multiple vaccines, 48% preferred conjugated vaccines over unconjugated polysaccharide vaccines. In Merck's two surveys, more than 90% of providers believe that it is important to administer pneumococcal vaccines to children under two years, and 90% or more providers believe that it is important to have product-specific data for immunocompromised or premature children. And of the five vaccine attributes assessed for hypothetical pneumococcal vaccines, immune response for the serotypes covered in PCV13 was given the highest importance. The work group's interpretation of acceptability of PCV20 use was yes for children under two years, 
For children with underlying conditions, the interpretation was split between probably yes and yes. Recommending PCV20 alone could simplify the recommendation storage and be less prone to vaccine administration errors. But some providers may not feel comfortable recommending PCV20 alone without PPSV23 for children with underlying conditions. Next is resource use. The majority of work group members believed that, oh, excuse me, um, sorry. Okay, as you saw in the presentations earlier, for routine PCV20 use compared with PCV13 or PCV15 in children under two years, base case range from cost saving to $125,000 per quality gained. There were differences across models related to indirect effects on adult disease. For PCV20 alone without PPSV23 use in children aged two to 18 years with an underlying conditions, PCV20 alone instead of PCV13 or 15 plus PPSV23 was found to be cost saving in most model scenarios and addition of PPSV23 to PCV20 had high cost per quality gained. The majority of work group members believe that PCV20 use was a good use of resources for both groups of children, although there were some minority opinions. Some selected probably yes, since PCV20 is an expensive vaccine and uncertainties in the effectiveness of the vaccine remain. For routine PCV20 use for children under two years, some mentioned the challenges in interpreting the cost effectiveness analysis findings because of different methods and assumptions used, resulting in a wide range of estimates. Also, the estimates are sensitive to vaccine launch price. Last domain is feasibility. The work group's interpretation was yes for both groups of children. For children under two years, routine PCV use has been recommended for more than 20 years. And for children with underlying conditions, the work group believed that recommending PCV20 only would result in a simpler streamlined recommendation, which is more feasible in general and or more likely to be followed in clinical practice. This is a summary of the work group's interpretation of ETR domains for the two PICO questions. The domains in red are additional work group interpretations that are new from February. For the first policy question, PCV20 use as an option for pneumococcal conjugate vaccination for children under two years, the work group believes that desirable consequences probably or clearly outweigh undesirable consequences in most settings. Additional serotypes covered by PCV20 are expected to prevent additional disease. However, some work group members believe that both PCV20 and PCV15 should be recommended since we only have immunogenicity study data for both PCV20 and PCV15, and clinical implications of the immunogenicity study findings are unknown. There was a range of cost-effectiveness analysis findings across different models, and it is good to have options for pneumococcal conjugate vaccines in case there are challenges with or delays in access to PCV20. And PCV13 is expected to be removed from the market after a transition period. For the second policy question, PCV20 use without PPSV23 for children two through 18 years with underlying medical conditions, the work group believes that desirable consequences probably outweigh undesirable consequences in most settings. Some work group members were in support of recommending PCV20 without PPSV23 for children with underlying conditions. Work group members value the simplicity of PCV20 use without PPSV23 and ease of vaccine storage. PCVs have immunologic advantages over PCV, PPSV23, and PCV20 provides the broadest serotype coverage among available PCVs. However, others were in support of recommending both PCV20 without PPSV23 and PCV15 with PPSV23. There are no data on PCV20 use in children with underlying medical conditions, whereas there are data for PCV15, and most importantly, to harmonize with the updated adult pneumococcal vaccine recommendations discussed during the October 2022 ACIP meeting, when we recommended adults who previously received PCV13 to complete their recommended vaccine series with either PCV20 or PPSV23. Now I will present four proposed policy options for a vote. First, routine PCV20 use for all children under 24 months. Use of either PCV15 
or PCV20 is recommended for all children aged 2 to 23 months according to currently recommended PCV dosing and schedules. The proposal is to keep the currently recommended number of PCV doses and schedules for children under 24 months, as shown here, but add PCV20 as an option to PCV15. Two, catch up PCV doses for children aged 24 to 71 months with an incomplete PCV vaccination status. For healthy children aged 24 to 59 months or through age 71 months for children with any underlying condition that increases the risk of pneumococcal disease hereafter risk condition with an incomplete PCV vaccination status, use of either PCV15 or PCV20 according to currently recommended PCV dosing and schedules is recommended. As presented earlier, the work group proposes to make the following changes to the risk conditions. Add chronic kidney disease, including those who are not on maintenance dialysis or have nephrotic syndrome. Add chronic liver disease. Add children with moderate persistent or severe persistent asthma. And change chronic renal failure to on maintenance dialysis for clarity. And similar to the first policy option, we propose to keep the recommended number of PCV doses and schedules the same, but add PCV20 as an option to PCV15. Three, children aged two to 18 years with any risk condition who have completed their recommended PCV doses before age six years. For children aged two to 18 years with any risk condition, who have received all recommended doses before age six years, and if the PCV doses were completed with at least one dose of PCV20, no additional doses of any pneumococcal vaccine are indicated. This recommendation may be updated as additional data become available. If the recommended PCV doses were completed using PCV13 or PCV15, but no PCV20, a dose of PCV20 or PPSV23 using previously recommended doses and schedule is recommended. And in the next few slides, I will review these policy options and figures. So currently, children with chronic medical conditions, cerebral spinal fluid leak or cochlear implant are recommended to receive all recommended doses of PCVs using either PCV13 or PCV15 before age six years, then a dose of PPSV23 at age two years or older. We now propose that if a child received PCV20 as part of their recommended PCV doses, then no additional doses of any pneumococcal vaccines are indicated. If a child did not receive PCV20 as part of their recommended PCV doses, then either a dose of PCV20 or PPSV23 is recommended. Currently, children with immunocompromising conditions are recommended to receive all recommended doses of PCVs using either PCV13 or PCV15, then up to two doses of PPSV23 at age two years or older. We now propose that if a child received PCV20 as part of their recommended PCV doses, then no additional doses of any pneumococcal vaccines are indicated. If a child did not receive PCV20 as part of their recommended PCV doses, then either a dose of PCV20 or PPSV23 as previously recommended is indicated. If a child has already received a dose of PPSV23, then a child can complete the recommended series with either a dose of PCV20 or PPSV23. Four. Children aged 6 to 18 years with any risk condition who have not received any dose of PCV. For children aged 6 to 18 years with any risk condition who have not received any dose of PCV13, PCV15, or PCV20, a single dose of PCV15 or PCV20 is recommended at least eight weeks after the most recent dose of a pneumococcal vaccine. When PCV15 is used, it should be followed by a dose of PPSV23 at least eight weeks later, if not previously given. And in the next few slides, I will highlight the changes from the current recommendations. Currently, if a child aged six to 18 years with chronic heart disease, chronic lung disease, or diabetes has never received a pneumococcal conjugate vaccine before age six years, 
then the child is only recommended to receive PPSV23. Children with other risk conditions are recommended to receive a dose of PCV and one or two doses of PPSV23, depending on their risk condition. We now propose that all PCV unvaccinated children 6 through 18 years with any risk condition be recommended to receive a dose of PCV. And a single dose of PPSV23 is recommended only if a child received PCV15 for their conjugate vaccine. And the intent is to harmonize with the adult pneumococcal vaccine recommendations. So finally, I have three more slides to go over clinical guidance for implementation, which will not be part of the vote, but will provide some context to the uh, voting language. PCV13 used for children under age six years. If only PCV13 is available when the child is scheduled to receive a PCV, PCV13 may be given as previously recommended. If a child started the PCV series with PCV13, the child may complete the series with PCV15 or PCV20 without giving additional doses. The PCV series does not need to be restarted. Children aged 6 to 18 years with a risk condition who have received PCV13 only. For children who have previously received PCV13 only, either a dose of PCV20 at least eight weeks later, or PPSB23 based on previous dosing and schedules is recommended. And the intent here is to again harmonize with the adult recommendations that were updated in October 2022. And lastly, children who have received hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Here we propose to use the same language that was proposed for adults during the October 2022 ACIP meeting, and that is to recommend four doses of PCB20 or if PCV20 is not available, three doses of PCV15 followed by a dose of PPSV23, unless they have chronic graft versus host disease, in which case a fourth dose of PCV15 is recommended in place of PPSV23. And we state that the patient's clinical team is best positions, positioned to determine the appropriate timing of vaccination. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. I'd like to thank the committee, the pneumococcal vaccines work group, and the following individuals for their contributions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kobayashi. You just received applause. <laughs> um, and this affirms my impression that these are the most complicated recommendations ever. So um, before we go on to discussion, um, we have a couple of industry colleagues who would like to give comments. Uh, I'm going to invite Dr. Rick Haupt to give comment, a comment from Merck. Um, I'm going to ask our colleagues to please limit it to three minutes or less for your comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, sound check. Can you hear me okay? We can. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi. It's Rick Haupt. I lead the Infectious Disease and Vaccines Global Medical and Scientific Affairs at Merck. And on behalf of Merck, we would like to thank the ACIP for their ongoing commitment to ensuring this thorough evidence-based evaluations of all pneumococcal vaccination policy options with the introduction of new PCVs. The proposed recommendation for PCV20 as an option to PCV15 ensures the availability of two vaccines that can provide public health benefit to infants and children. And as you consider these benefits in preparation for the vote, I, I just wanted to highlight two points. The first point relates to the immune responses of, of, of pneumococcal vaccines. It's important that new PCVs maintain immunogenicity for the common vaccine type serotypes, especially for serotypes such as serotype three, that has continued to be a significant contributor to residual pneumococcal disease burden. We acknowledge that there's a, it's challenging to evaluate the potential benefits of new PCVs uh, due to reliance on immunogenicity endpoints um, and, and recognize that immunobridging through the application of non-inferiority statistical endpoints provides a methodology for evaluation through comparison to a standard with established efficacy. However, as noted during today's introduction to the pneumococcal vaccine session, the clinical implications of reduced immunogenicity are unknown. Despite this, it is important to consider the potential impact of reduced immunogenicity on vaccine effectiveness for new PCVs, especially during the first year of life and among high-risk populations where serious disease risk is highest. And then my second point relates to protection on, in those high-risk children. Um, and, and for optimal protection, children with underlying medical conditions who receive PCV13, PCV15, or PCV20 for their routine infant series 
should receive another pneumococcal vaccine dose after the age of two years. Uh, the review of the pneumococcal disease epidemiology during the February meeting demonstrated the significant higher risk of serious pneumococcal disease among children with underlying conditions, especially immunocompromised children who typically generate a less robust immune response after vaccination with pneumococcal vaccines compared to healthy children. For this reason, availability of clinical trial data in high risk groups is critical to evaluate the potential differences in immune responses. And as noted, in the most recent presentation by Dr. Kobayashi, a healthcare provider pre pre preference survey that was conducted by Merck um, highlighted the importance of immunogenicity data in special populations. Um, so with that, um, I, I wanna conclude by thanking again uh, for give, being given the opportunity to comment and for your thoughtful and objective consideration of the evidence presented today. Uh, and we look, we look forward to continue to work with the working group in the future um, as we continue to bring new pneumococcal conjugate vaccines for consideration. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next, we have Dr. Kane from Pfizer who would uh, like to make comments and I'll just reiterate what we're hoping for three minutes or less. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, just audio checking, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Please go ahead. Okay, my name is Alejandro Cane. I am the Vaccines and Antivirals uh, Medical and Scientific Affairs Lead for Pfizer. Uh, I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to speak. As was demonstrated today, uh, this is burden for streptococcal pneumonia due to serotypes not currently covering the PCBs remains a major cause of morbidity and mortality, particularly among children less than five years of age. PCB20 has the potential to address a substantial proportion of the remaining burden of pneumococcal disease in children. The additional seven serotypes containing PCB20 have been selected based on the surveillance systems such as the ABC and are responsible for around 30% of the current IPD in children less than five years of age. Pfizer has conducted additional analysis to evaluate the cost effectiveness of a supplemental dose of PCB20 for children 14 to 59 months old who completely the recommended PCB13 series. The results of the analysis show that the increase in the risk of protection in this cohort could potentially prevent more than a quarter of million antimicrobial resistant infections, more than 5,000 IPD cases, and around 1,800 deaths across the lifespan. PCB20 is now licensed for our physicians and family who want the broadest serotype pneumococcal coverage available. PCB20 is safe to be given to children who previously received PCB13. A supplemental dose is a time-limited intervention that will most significantly impact children born between 2019 and 2021, promoting health equity in those who were most affected by the pandemic lowers infant vaccination rates. This is a time-sensitive issue, and we look forward to the committee clear guidance at today's meeting. Pfizer would like to thank the ACIP committee for your careful deliberation and dedication to preventing infectious disease uh, in the US. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Um, and uh, we will now open the presentations from the session uh, for, for any questions or comments. Um, we're just working on, because there are so many votes and I'm not even sure they can fit onto one slide, uh, we may go through uh, vote by vote, um, just to put it up there. So while while people are asking their questions, which you may ask about any of them, I'll ask to put, thank you, <laughs> uh, some of the votes up so that we can at least look at them together. Dr. Lair. Thank you very much for a lovely presentation. Um, I guess my big question is, I understand the harmonization and that makes it reasonable to possibly include PCV15 with PPSV23. And I also, I, I sort of go back to what Dr. Talbot said, why are we continuing PPSV23 and do we even really need to? Is there a benefit that I'm missing? And if PPSV23 is really not cost effective when added, I, I guess I'm sort of wondering why are we continuing it? And also slightly, why are we continuing PCV15? I understand that it's helpful to have two options, but if, PP, if PCV20 is better than PCV15, why are we recommending PCV15? So 
Thank you. Um, thank you for that question. And uh, that was definitely something that uh, we discussed as a work group. And, and primarily um, PPSB 23, uh, understanding that um, there are some children who have already you know, started their series, PPSB 23 series or completed their PPSB 23 series. And um, given that the work group uh, is, is not you know, currently proposing a supplemental uh, PCB 20 dose for children who completed the um, the rec currently recommended uh, vaccine series. You know, w the intent was to keep that polysaccharide option, you know, for this transition period. Um, so, and then uh, harmonization with the adult recommendation, as you mentioned, was a, um, another big one. Uh, we had a lot of discussion last year when we discussed the adult um, vaccine recommendations. And then um, in the end, uh, we decided to um, harmonize with what we discussed for the adult recommendations as well, which is to keep the PPSB 23 option during this transition phase. Oh, Dr. Paley? Um, and I think it's very important to remind everybody, all we have is immunogenicity data. We have no effectiveness and no um, efficacy data on either PCV15 or PCV20. PCV15 does have an increased immunogenicity um, to serotype 3, which is an important cause of pneumococcal disease today. We don't know what is the immune correlate that will um, result in protection. And so I think that is a really important question. And so this, we think that this approach provides the important protection, and we also acknowledge that our CDC colleagues are masters at doing um, epidemiology surveillance that will provide the insights for future directions. Dr. Talbot, before you jump in, uh, are you gonna make a comment specifically about this? Okay, go ahead. Um, I agree with Dr. Paling. I just would also like to add, though, we have absolutely zero efficacy data for PPSV23. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to, I'm actually going to jump in just because it relates to this topic, but I'm going to cede to my colleagues in a moment. So um, I actually prefer the consistency with the adult recommendations around the risk groups. Um, that to me is simplifying. I do think it'll be helpful to. Um, continue to add uh, references and uh, continued uh, investigation to understand uh, what, the new, uh, what the prevalence of pneumococcal disease is in these high-risk populations. So just a uh, plea to continue to add to the literature with the excellent surveillance data that's going on. Um, but from a pragmatic perspective, the consistency with adult rec risk, uh, rec recommendations uh, regarding high-risk groups would be helpful. Oh, boy. I haven't had enough coffee this morning. But the second thing I did want to make a statement on is that I don't believe we have enough data for a preferential recommendation at this time. If I did, I think I would feel more strongly about one versus the other. But to me, this is not about simplification from that perspective. It's that we would have to have data justified to make a preference for one or the other. Um, in this particular situation, I'm actually in favor of vaccine choice. Um, I do believe that implementation factors in the market will determine whether or not there's essentially a preference that happens over time. Um, but I don't think we have the data to um, make that determination today. Um, next, I'll call on Dr. Long. So the other considerations um, were that the slightly lowered immunogenicity of several serotypes in the 20, we don't have the evidence if this will translate to any clinical inferiority. And the second is to keep both available because we're, you know, fewer serotypes with 15, maybe better for three, more serotypes for 20, maybe inferior for some that are connected, and to keep 15 viable now that there is a 20, we have to have something to be able to offer those who got 15 if they require broader uh, coverage because of underlying conditions or immunocompromise. So that would be either 20 or the broader coverage of 23. And I, we've heard about PPSV23 and its potential lack of efficacy. One of the things that has been shown immunologically is that PCVs 
followed by 23 give a better response to those 23s. So messy, pneumococcal vaccines at the moment are messy, and we're trying to make them a little bit coordinated with what's already out there. Dr. Sanchez. No, thank you, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I agree, first of all, with, um, with the uh, recommendations as or in the suggestions as listed here, although I imagine that um, eventually we will be moving to the PCV 20. Um, or higher. Or higher. <laughs> um, yes, exactly. Um, my, I just wanted to clarify one thing, though. In children, healthy children who have received their PCV 13, followed by a two-year um, PCV or P PPSV um, 23, who have an underlying condition such as cochlear implant, for instance, is there any recommendation to provide or any PCV 20 coverage, knowing that this, you know, the that piece that the pneumococcal 23 valent is not a great uh, vaccine. Can you repeat? So could you yeah. repeat the question? No, so my co my comment is those who've been fully immunized with the PCV13 and have gotten pneumovax, pneumococcal 23 at two years of age. Um, and have an underlying condition, in my case, uh, cochlear implant um, children, should there be any boosting with a um, PCV 20 currently? Yes, um, thank you for that question. Uh, this is Dr. Kobayashi. So um, currently, uh, the work group proposal um, does not include a proposal for a supplemental P uh, PCV 20 dose for children who completed the currently recommended um, series. But if they're in between the recommended series, for example, if a child, even a compromised child, received uh, the recommended PCV 13 doses in a dose of PPSV 23, then uh, we propose an option to receive a dose of PCV 20. Yes. Dr. Paling. Um, and so, um, Dr. Sanchez, I very much thank you for this question. And we need to humbly uh, acknowledge that PCV20 was not studied in um, children with underlying conditions, so we do not have the data to really answer that question, but we will be doing the surveillance to be able to answer that question in the future. Ms. McNally. Thank you, Dr. Paling. Can you tell us, if we are to vote in favor of the recommendations as proposed today, how long it would take for the work group to come back to ACIP and provide an update regarding data about PCV20 in real world conditions? Yes, so um, it, it's a bit hard to um, provide, you know, when exactly the data will be available because it, it, there's a several factors, you know, you know, how quickly we can get the surveillance data. You know, usually there is a lag in completing the surveillance data. For example, it, it took us a while to get the 2022 data, um, which is still preliminary to present to the uh, work group. And also, it, there's also a matter of, you know, how quickly the vaccine uptake happens um, once uh, there is a recommendation. But, you know, our goal is to get, uh, share that with the community as soon as uh, they're available, because as it was <laughs> alluded to, we know that there are already higher valency vaccines in the pipeline, so. Dr. Paling. Um, and so, uh, Ms. McNally, I wanna thank you, because that brings me to a comment. And my goal in this comment is to align all who are working to protect um, all of us from pneumococcal disease. PCV7 and 13 were studied in children first before studies in adults. This experience demonstrated that pneumococcal conjugate vaccine in children not only protects these vaccinated children, but also has indirect effects for adults. It is important and notable that these indirect effects on adults were modeled in the cost effectiveness studies that were shown today. Experience has also taught us that new, uh, more pronounced viral seasons are associated with increased bacterial disease, including pneumococcal disease. 
we never know when we will have a severe um, viral season as we did this summer, this winter. We saw more cases of mastoiditis, which is a serious complication of ear infections, and pneumonia requiring chest tubes than I have seen for the last 20 years. There was a lot of invasive more invasive pneumococcal disease than I've seen for 20 years. This winter reminded us the importance of pneumococcal conjugate vaccine in children, and I respectfully ask that future pneumococcal vaccine candidates return to the original approach and be studied in children first. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Lair? Um, two logistical questions. Um, one is there is a comment in Dr. Miyawaka's slides about a launch price for PCV20. Is there any reason to expect the PCV20 for children to be a different price than for adults? That would seem odd. Yes, um, thank you for that question. So I think we're uh, pretty comfort uh, comfortable with the, um, what the price will be in the private market, but what we don't know is what the VFC price will be. Uh, and, and there will be a negotiation process, which um, Dr. Santoli is, has more expertise in, but um, just wanted to share that. Thank you. Bef yeah, before we go to Dr. Sant, um, can I just ask our colleagues from Pfizer if they anticipate anything different? Um, Thank you. We can hear you. Thank you for your question, Dr. Lee. This is uh, Mark Rosenbaum. So Pfizer is still evaluating the VFC price for PCV20. For the analysis, we submitted a price range of $160.20 to $195.80 was used, with uh, $178 as the base case value that was employed. Uh, we explored the impact of these price ranges in scenario analysis and sensitivity analysis in all cases where we're cost saving, and we can confirm that the price uh, range, the VFC price range will be within the price range I just mentioned. Could you repeat the price range? I'm sorry, I got lost. $160.20 up to $195.80. What was the upper limit, please? $195.80. Thank you. And did you say that was VFC or um, private? VFC. And do you have a private numbers? The private uh, price is currently $253.96. Thank you. I think I, I just want to say that we look to you to let us know when to begin the VFC negotiation process through the vote that we're going to take. So we have not been in any sort of a process because that follows your wisdom about what needs to be in the formulary. Thanks. Thank you. And that was Dr. Santoli. Um, and then my, my second point is I'd like to make another request of our insurance colleagues I still have some insurance companies which are not covering PCV15 for children because the MMWR was published last September and they have 12 months before they have to cover the vaccine. So I would like to give kudos to those insurances. I have one which says as soon as it is um, published in the MMWR, it is automatically covered by their insurance. But I have other insurances which I'll be honest, drag their feet and wait until the last minute before they start covering. So it would be lovely if this could get covered more quickly in the private practices. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments? So just to cl clarify, um, 
we are anticipating this will eventually go to a vote later today. So I'm wondering if we can go back to the slide before and um, look at vote number one. Uh, just affirming, Dr. Kobayashi, this is four separate votes, correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. So for vote number one, we have use of either PCV15 or PCV20 is recommended for all children ages 2 to 23 months according to the currently recommended PCV dosing and schedules. Um, would anyone like to make a motion? Dr. Sineas. I would like to make a motion to adopt the language of the first vote. So vote number one. And Ms. Bata? I second that motion. Wonderful. It's been moved and seconded for vote number one. Any questions or concerns? I'm seeing people ready to move on to vote number two. So um, for healthy children ages 24 to 59 months or through age 71 months for children with any underlying condition that increases the risk of pneumococcal disease, hereafter risk condition, with an incomplete PCV vaccination status, use of either 15 or 20 according to currently recommended PCV dosing and schedules is recommended. Do I have a motion? Dr. Daly. Um, just a quick comment first, which is that when I read this at first, I was confused by the or through age 71 months, I think maybe because I was reading quickly. So if we could just, and I, and I don't think we need to wordsmith by committee, but just make it clear that the 71 months is for the kids with chronic health conditions by separating that out. And then with that as a clarification, but not a suggestion to change the wording, I would uh, make a motion to accept the language. Dr. Kobayashi, I just want to confirm Dr. Daly's impression is correct. Yes, that is correct. Uh, for healthy children, it's through 59 months. And if a child has any underlying condition, then it's through 71 months. Two commas will do it. Yeah. <laughs> I knew I could count on Dr. Long. <laughs> um, Dr. Long, would you like to second this? I would like to second this motion. Great. It's been moved and seconded. We accept the wording for vote number two. Um, we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, number three, for children ages 2 to 18 years with any risk condition who have received all recommended doses before age 6 years um, with the bullets below. Move to accept the language for um, vote. Vote number three, okay. Thank you. Motion on the table for vote number three. Ms. Bata? I second that. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. I, sorry, it took me a moment to read through the entire vote number three, so <laughs> Dr. Long beat me to it. Um, wonderful. So we'll move on to vote number four for children ages 6 to 18 years with any risk condition who have not received any dose of PCV 13, 15, or 20. A single dose of PCV 15 or PCV 20 is recommended at least eight weeks after the most recent dose of pneumococcal vaccination. When PCV15 is used, it should be followed by a dose of PPSV23 at least eight weeks later, if not previously given. Do I have a motion? Dr. Sanchez. I just have a question. Um, so for children who've never received any dose, then a single dose is recommended after the most recent dose, but they've never received a dose. Or am I? Dr. Paley? They could have received polysaccharide vaccine, and that's what we're referring to, because the current recommendation for some of these children is only to receive polysaccharide vaccine, and so we want to make sure all children with these conditions have an opportunity to have a conjugate protection. Thank you for that clarification. Dr. Kobayashi? Yes, and I, I also wanted to add that, you know, in this age group, you know, there could still be somebody who received PCV7. Um, so we're including that group as well. Mm. Yeah, so maybe maybe include what that you mean, the, PC, the PPSV23 after that. It, it would have to be at the end of the first sentence in parentheses. I think it would be IE, nothing else, 7, PCV7 or PPSV23. Is there anything else? There's nothing else they could have received. So it would be in parenthesis, i.e., PCV7 or PPSV23, close parentheses. I think that probably does make it cleaner. I mean, it's understood, so you can decide if you want more or fewer words. 
And, and this also just includes people who might not have been vaccinated at all for some reason too, correct? I'm gonna um, ask that the new McCockle team uh, provide the clarifications they feel will make this recommendation as clear as possible to the public and to our providers, um, but asking for a motion on the table for this particular vote with potentially modified language, but the content of the vote will remain the same. Anyone want to make a motion? A motion to approve. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sanchez wishes to put the motion on the table. A second? Dr. Daly? Second the motion. Thank you. So we have... Uh, moved and seconded for vote number four as well. And if there's any minor advised language, we'll um, leave it to the team to bring it back for the full vote. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Um, Jeannie Santoli to go through the VFC resolution that's proposed following this vote. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna go through the resolution. It should be extremely familiar uh, based on what you've just been discussing. Next slide. So the purpose of this resolution is to update, oh, let me just say that the language here that's in orange is the language that is changed and the black language is the language that's existing in the resolution right now. The purpose of this resolution is to update the recommendations regarding the use of pneumococcal conjugate vaccines for children to include 20 valent PCV as an option. Next slide. The first component of the resolution is the PCV component. Uh, the eligible groups information is unchanged. Next slide. There's a, a table in this section, however, that has been updated to be consistent with the information you've just been reviewing where the two groups of non-immunocompromising chronic medical conditions, which is shown here with the changes that are similar to what you've just discussed. And on the next slide, the um, children who fall into the immunocompromising conditions. Next slide. The recommended vaccine schedule and dosage intervals um, there's the addition of PCV20, as you can see, and there are two new footnotes. You see one is noted at the top. We'll get to that in just a minute. Otherwise, this section is unchanged. Next slide. Here you'll notice that there's a, a slight difference in the way the children are described in this table refers back to table one that you just saw. And then there's a new footnote, footnote six. Next slide for the footnotes. So the first footnote is um, updated to include PCV20. The second footnote is to indicate that PCV13, if that's what's available, then the child can receive PCV. I, I hope I said PCV13, now I'm confused, but you can read that. <laughs> that can be used. Um, and then the, the sixth footnote is also new. Next slide. The dosage and contraindications and precautions information is unchanged other than that this um, link takes you to the FDA website, which will have the PCV20 package insert as well. Next slide. This is the second component of the resolution. Uh, the eligible groups are unchanged. Again, it refers back to table one. Next slide. The recommended vaccine schedule and dosage intervals. So here, for children 2 to 18 years of age who received the recommended PCV dose at age greater than 6 years, you're referred back to the information in Table 2. Footnote 6, specifically, that we just looked at. And then Table 3 actually addresses the schedule for children 2 to 18 years of age who completed their recommended PCV doses before age 6 years. And again, the, the names of the groups have changed. So I'm going to give you a minute to look at this. Um, and then there are two columns, the schedule for PCV20 or PPSV23, and then vaccination with PCV20 or revaccination with PPSV23. Dr. 
Dr. Long. An important comma missing in the previous, um, where it says one dose of PCV20 or PSV23 administered, it, it reads as at age two years and eight weeks. Oh. So it should say at, at, at greater, at, at least two years of age, comma, and eight weeks after last indicated. We will make that change. Thank, Thank you. you. Add a comma. Yep. Commas are <laughs> really important. I'm going to move on to the next slide. And this again has continued the children with immunocompromising conditions, the children with an immunocompromising condition who have not received PCV20, option two, there's two options, and then option three. So. Waco, do just, you have any comments that you want to make? Just to clarify, I'm, uh, just option one, two, or three, are we considering these options? Or, because I'm, I'm trying to understand the difference between one and th three, because I thought it should be three, but. Just to clarify, so with immunocompromising conditions, we would recommend so um, here I can explain. So if you have immunocompromising conditions and you haven't received 20, you can get 20. You can have, if you've had um, 15, you can get a dose of PPSV23. And if you've got an immunocompromising condition, then five years later, you can either get 20 or a second PPSV23 so that we can be accommodate all the um, options that people could have. Because remember, there's two doses okay. that are recommended. And so we're explaining that if you got 23 once, you could end up with 20, or you could keep to 23. And then just to confirm for option one, would they not also get another dose five years after the first no. dose of PCV20? OK. Um, Thank you for putting that up. That's what I needed. <laughs> if you could go back to that slide, the the bottom right corner just said one dose, and it didn't specify one dose of what. So um, we, what we need to do is the headers did not continue on every slide. So let's also go back to the slide that has the headers before we go back and look at that row. And uh, I apologize for that. So the headers did not continue. In the resolution, they're all, it's all listed together, but I broke it up artificially for the slide, so I think that probably is confusing. I, I still might put a... Still would prefer a change. Because you've got two vaccines referenced, in the, not this slide, for the next slide, bottom right, the one dose five years, one dose of, of what? I, I assume it's PCV20. Not another PPSV23. Right. Bottom right corner, Kath, Dr. Paling. That the way it's written is correct, and some I do wonder if um, the picture that you just showed um, would um, provide even more clarity. Here is um, the same information. There so, is a little word, the words go to the, the words, words slide, the text. I, I mean, it should be clear. So let's look at that. This is not where I thought we'd get hung up, but. <laughs> I had the same trouble that, um, <laughs> I had the same trouble understanding it, first of all, if you're supposed to try to read across or whatever. So see at the top here, it says on that second column, vaccination with PCV20 or revaccination with PSV23. That's correct, but let's look at the next one. It's confusing a little bit because you don't repeat. Um, so the, the second cell 
down, third over. That's fine. And the third cell should say one dose of PPSV23 after the first right. dose of PPSV23. We will add that in. And, then, and this one also needs its commas, so it's not two years and eight yeah. weeks. We will be generous with the commas. More commas. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Long, for clarifying that. That actually now makes sense to me, too. Um, any additional questions? Ms. McNally. Dr. Lee, as we close out this session, I'm wondering if it would be possible for the American Academy of Pediatrics to comment on this issue. Thank you. Do we have someone on from AAP today? Uh, yeah, hi. This is Sean O'Leary. I think David Kimberlin is on as well. Um, sorry, what specifically would you like me to comment on? About the four votes. Oh. Uh, good question. Um, uh, we don't we don't have an official position. I, I see the complexity of the questions. I'll, I'll let David comment, and and, and uh, he and I can circle back and or, or discuss and see if we have anything uh, specific we want to um, recommend. Thank you, Dr. O'Leary. Actually, and you know what? I'm going to give you a moment. Uh, because we do need to close out with a motion on the VFC, so you get a little break, and then we'll come back to you. Um, just raise your hand when you're ready. Um, Dr. Long has another comment. Another comment on the final lines of this slide. Dr. Santoli, final lines of this slide. It, it's not actually correct that the chronic medical conditions are non-immunocompromising. They probably are. And that's why, why does diabetes have more invasive pneumococcal disease? So I would not take out, I would take out non-immunocompromising. So let's go to the table because I, I want to make sure we're consistent with the table and make changes. Do you mind, Mawako, do you mind going back, back to the... We don't use those words, non-immunocompromising, in our recommendations for pneumococcal vaccine. We use the word... It's confusing. We use the word chronic medical condition that puts you at increased risk of pneumococcal disease. Okay. So, so we would make the change here as well, I guess is why, why I wanted to go back to here, because that footnote was referring to this. So we can remove right. the word non-immunocompromising from both places. You could put in that increase the risk of pneumococcal disease. It's called risk conditions. Yeah. No, we'll just re we'll remove that's that. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. And I think we might have one more slide. Um, Let's finish this up. At the end. Can we get to the last slide? And this um, is showing that these things are unchanged again, except for that there's a new package insert. If you go to that FDA link, and then the last slide is a reminder that when a recommendation is published following this, that that is incorporated by reference. That's Thank it. you for allowing us to make sure that they're harmonized in the end. <laughs> we always appreciate that. Um, would anyone like to make a motion for this VFC vote? And I think the VFC vote is pretty straightforward. Uh, but is there a slide on this? Uh, and Ms. Bata is already ready to make a motion. Uh, yes, I'd like to move that we accept the, the revised language for the adoption of PCV20. Thank you, Ms. Bata. Second, Dr. Dr. Sanchez. I can second. Thank you. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded that we accept the VFC vote for um, updating the pneumococcal vaccine recommendations. Um, and we will table this until the vote section. And I see uh, Dr. O'Leary has his hand up. Right. So um, we don't have, so we agree with the, the general gestalt of the work group on the, um, the various votes in terms of um, no preference for one or the other for the routine recommendations, recognizing the um, complexity of the immunogenicity, question, outstanding immunogenicity and effectiveness questions. Um, so in, in general, we are we are in support of, of the work group recommendations. Um, I, I guess if there are more specific questions, we're happy to try and address those as well. Um, you know, we, we also recognize that there are a lot of other PCV um, 
20 vaccine or I'm sorry, uh, pneumococcal conjugate vaccines in development. So recognizing as well that this is dynamic and we have to be nimble as we move forward uh, with with new data and new vaccines. Um, and I want to second, I, I think a couple of um, the, the voting members mentioned the importance of um, studying these vaccines um, in the conditions for which they are um, uh, being uh, uh, recommended. Um, prior to our recommendation, I think uh, moving forward, that would be really nice if we could have those data before we have to make a recommendation. Um, but you know, in general, I think all of this is is great news. We, we the the more vaccines we can have to prevent disease, the better. And uh, clear, I, I think the addition of PCV twenty to our options is is really going to be of great benefit to children. Um, and again, happy to answer any specific questions. Thank you, Dr. O'Leary. And we'll just add that probably this will have great impact on older adults as well. So um, it's a good set of childhood recommendations. We are now going to end this session and take a 10-minute break. So we will meet, oh my goodness, at um, three minutes to the hour. So 57 minutes. <laughs> I'm giving you 10 minutes. All right. Thank you.